Welcome, everybody, to the latest installment of, uh, quite frankly, the podcast. We've got a special treat for you today. We're going to do a proper walkthrough of the and talk through of the Private Parts movie uh, released in March seventh, uh, I believe, nineteen ninety seven. Ben, have I got that right? Yeah, twenty three years. We're coming up on three. Three days before my birthday, and no, I did not see it for my birthday because I wasn't such a fan. But before we started, I want to ask um, our special guest, Benjamin, and our my wonderful co-host, Sam, what they thought of the movie when they first saw it and what was their status as fans at the time. Well, I had been a f- fan of Howard's for three years at that point, and I was a super fan and I knew from the first trailer that I saw in a theater before, I don't remember which movie it was, that, that we were in trouble. This was made to look like it was a romance kind of picture. You know, it was like a guy running on a horse and you were unaware that, I haven't seen it since it was in theaters, you were unaware that it was private parts. And then they actually show you some scenes from private parts. And I thought, this isn't what I was picturing. Mm-hmm. So when I actually got to see it, I was rapidly dialing the radio station in Las Vegas that I listened to that broadcast Howard's show, trying to win tickets to their premiere of it, mm-hmm. which I wasn't able to do. But I was able to get tickets to the night before opening day screening that they had. So in every city that aired Howard's show, they offered a screening the night before the official release date so that you mm-hmm. could, and it was sold out. It was all Howard fans. And the reason private parts opened at number one is because they cheated and counted the sales from those screenings towards their three day total. It was actually a three and a half day total. That's so right. actually jungle to jungle Disney's movie did win the box office that weekend for the three day total. And that's why Disney was, uh, uh, contesting the results on Monday and why Howard had to go on Larry King and say, um, I'm under attack by Disney because they lied and included uh, tickets that they should not have included. So anyway, yeah. I saw it in the theater. It was a rabid audience. And from the beginning, I hated the style. I don't like the um, multiple narrators talking to the camera, doing the Woody Allen thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, was a, I was in film school at the time. And I felt as the movie went on, this is not going to get better. And it didn't. I saw it one other time at a dollar theater about a month later with a friend who hadn't seen it. And it was, you saw it with a real audience at this point. There was no courtesy, courtesy laughter. There was no, um, uh, oh, I recognize that guy. It just fell flat. And um, I think it, by that point, Reicher, the company that produced the film and spent $25 million on it, was about to get out of the movie business completely because of the bomb that Private Parts was. Well, the, 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 the total according to Box Office Mojo was something like 28 million for the actual production. And then it was another, we, we know it was at least 15 to 25 million in marketing because in New York at least it was marketed up the ass. Full page spreads, uh, billboards, uh, swag promo, uh, and then he had of course a year to promote them, the making of it. Which is on invaluable his own marketing. Show. Yes. Which is invaluable. Is, a year of promotion. And if you if you r- rationalize and say, okay, he did have 10 million listeners in the New York area, at least every one of them would, if they were super fans, would have bought a ticket. That's 80 million and, uh, domestically. But uh, it didn't work out that way, obviously, because the no. fans didn't get what they wanted. No, Sam, you were wouldn't... a mere you you were a mere slip of a youth when it came out. So did you see? I hope you didn't see it. No, uh, I didn't see underage. It I knew who Howard Stern was because my dad like would let us listen to it on the ride to school sometimes. So I liked him, but I didn't know about the movie until it was on USA, I believe. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I happened to, I was confused by it because I didn't realize that he played in the movie because by the time I started listening, the private parts, the movie talk was all but done with. Mm-hmm. So we, he wasn't discussing it that much the way he did when it was coming out. Yep. So when I first saw it, I was confused. I was like, what is this? I didn't understand the way the story was being told. It jumped around you a lot. from the beginning? Yeah, from the beginning. And I was like, 
I, I just didn't understand why they were in the movie kind of thing. Cause I knew they weren't actors. So that confused me. Mm. I thought this was like a joke. <laughs> like, like but an over long SNL sketch. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was like, Oh, I didn't well, know. I knew I... it was a book. My dad had okay. the book. I don't know. I just, I never saw it. And I stumbled upon it one day on USA and I oh. had an indifference to it. I didn't really care about it that much. I didn't think it was great. I, I wasn't, the, I, think the, I didn't I think laugh. The general, the I general think the population agreed with you. One scene. Yeah. yeah. You left at one scene. Was it the Frisbee throwing scene? Yes. Yes. Same. Yeah. <laughs> that was the, yeah. The physical gag is the only scene that really gets any laughs. And they use that in the previews. So uh, I was not surprised to see him throw a Frisbee at a guy's head in the movie. Well, yeah. And that was the thing is when they show the trailer is supposed to have certain four or five four three or four moments there's supposed to be movie moments in the trailer and once you have those movie the movie moments you can release your you know you've got your trailer and you read the film's fine it's complete but in this case i believe there were some scenes in the trailer that weren't in the movie first of all and there is a whole uh, edited cut there's someone a fan they call it a work print edition that's out there i used to have it but i deleted it years ago just because i thought it wasted space on my hard drive and um when i first saw the film it was in a double screening of Donnie Brasco and Private Parts, which opened about a week apart from yep. each other. And it was something like three bucks because it was a small little screening room, maybe about, I don't know, 25 seats. It was a really small, independent little theater. And there were literally three people in the audience, me, my girlfriend, and some drunk in the back because he just wanted to sleep something off for four hours. And we we saw it, and having only read the book Private Parts and Miss America at the time, and then... Oh, you hadn't listened not- to the show? I hadn't listened to the show, and I thought the book Private Parts oh. was funny, so I thought, okay, this could be am- this could be amusing. And I go, what is this rom com shit? And uh, I I did not I I didn't really laugh. That was the one scene I laughed at. That was about yeah. It. Well, you've read the book, so you know that the movie has very little to do with the book aside from That's the right. title. And as far as the rom com goes, Howard has since the early eighties. Um, driven away all female listeners from his show. He, uh, in his first year, I believe, at WNBC, drove away a million women and teenagers from listening to his radio show and replaced them all with men 18 to 54 or whatever that age group is. So yeah. uh, so it took a while for him to actually see a growth because he, he drove away so many people. And, mm-hmm. and always women had, not, had found him repulsive. Yep. So... By design, this was going to be a thing that would satisfy women. Mm-hmm. It'd be satisfying the women who were dragged there by their super fan boyfriends or reviewing the movie. But or... I was con- yeah, confused sorry. at what it was trying to be. Like, I remember watching it and trying to decide, what is this? Yeah. Like, I wasn't sure. Is this a biopic? Is this a comedy? Is this a love story? Like, I... I was genuinely confused by it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I say it's a love story only because they tell you this is a love story because the way he behaves is not a love story. You know, telling your wife, Hey, I uh, accepted a job in another state. We move tomorrow. That's not a love story. That's not all about (laughs) Allison. Um, The movie is always him just pulling the rug out from under her. And uh, at the end he says, but it's all for her. And where people are dumb, so they go, it was all for her. It's not all for her. It's not a love story. It's tw- it took the- Howard rejected 24 drafts of the script before uh, signing off on this one because he had script approval. Right. So he signed on with a script and said, yes, this is it, and then said he asked for a rewrite and a rewrite and a rewrite and a rewrite. I believe that it wasn't Howard rejecting these scripts but Don Buckwald because mm-hmm. Howard was ready to do – Fart man. He was ready to do anything. I was um, just talking about that with Phil Moore. I was saying how funny this clip was of Jerry Seinfeld telling him not to do the fart man thing. He was like, can I give you a piece of advice? Yeah. Don't, don't do the fart man thing. And he was like, I'm going to, it's going to be the best movie of the year, Jerry. You see, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know comedy. I know comedy. Like, okay. Oh, yeah. He went into full porcupine mode, squ- quills out because someone was telling him the truth. Don't make this stupid 
Fartman movie. Yeah. And the um, I'm listening. I was re-listening to and editing the uh, history of Howard Stern, the the whole part about the movie pre and post production, and then the the actual um, grosses. And we're going to discuss that everybody who's listening uh, in another show. We're going to discuss the fallout and also some of the press interviews. We're going to go through them because they're actually quite hilarious and in, I think more entertaining than the film itself personally. But um, the uh, the tr- the pr- production was troubled because they wanted John G. Avildsen to do the to direct it, I believe. The, the, the Rocky the guy directed Rock. Yeah, originally that was the story, right? right? Well, and yeah, Ivan Howard Reitman. Went, and, yeah, Howard even went so far as to say his his life story is the story of Rocky, right. and uh, which is there's nothing about Rocky <laughs> and, and Howard together, you except know, for if it's like him and Ralph running down the beach in like short shorts, like biking. You could like do a side by side. Yeah, that's what <laughs> is that? It. Three or four, but people get this idea that Howard triumphs over Imus at the end of this movie, and that's not the case. They were on the same no. station; they were not competing. No. Howard was on in afternoons. Imus that's was right. on in the morning. So there was no Rocky moment of where he takes on his competitor. And, and, and as far as the pig vomit character, he's a composite, largely fictional villain. Because if, if you if you listen back to the history of Howard Stern, as I have done. This guy who they base pig vomit on is not much of a presence over the years. He's mm-hmm. uh, oftentimes laughing in the background at stuff that they're doing. So they really just needed a villain and you can't. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, I believe that Howard decided his life was Rocky's life because he thought he can get the director of Rocky. Then yeah. when he couldn't and I, uh, Ivan Reitman pushed him to get Betty Thomas, he decided I'm a feminist and I work well with women. But that's also not the case. They wanted somebody to uh, give a woman's touch and hallmark him so that this was a marketable story to women. But he marketed it too, saying, like, all women in my life have furthered my career, like Robin Quivers and Judith Regan, who was his book publisher. So that's when he just decided to leech onto that narrative, I suppose. Yeah. It was a very handy narrative because, like I said, people will believe it if you just tell them that's what it is. Well, the other thing is, though, by getting Betty Thomas, um, Ivan Reitman was going to be able to, pardon the expression, bitch slap her around if he didn't want something in the film. With John G. Avildsen, who is a noted and I believe Oscar winning director, um, he was not going to um, – I could be wrong about that. I can check later. Uh, but he, I, he was not going to be able to tell him what to do. But with Betty Thomas, who only had a few credits at the time, I think the Brady Bunch movie and The Late Shift. Um, and they were, that was an HBO film. This was just strictly, let's have control of the director as well. And she'll be pleased and grateful that she has this big gig and she'll do what we say. And that, that, that's pretty much how Reitman started to work near the end of the eighties when he stopped directing almost completely. Also to Howard with men that he feels uncomfortable around, which is a lot of them who are more masculine type. Like I, can remember him doing an interview where Toby Maguire was just coming out and he was being so inappropriate and asking him these questions about his girlfriend and having sex and Is that on Leno? You know, yeah, that was on Leno. But mm-hmm. that's kind of his he I could never imagine him taking direction from a male director and not performing no, no, no. and he couldn't do it. He'd be way too uncomfortable. Although mm-hmm. if it had been the Rocky director, would we have ended this movie with Howard punching out his bosses to to show them that he's the the victor, you know, rather than having ACDC fly 22 hours from Australia to celebrate his fifth place, which is as high as he got in the afternoons, fifth place um, uh, achievement of, of um, you know, in, in 1854, he was number one, but overall he was fifth place. Do um, you think that the Rocky guy would have said, no, we need something bigger. Punch <laughs> out, punch him out. <laughs> Yeah, well, that 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 we'll deal with. When, we'll talk about it when we get through it. Should we get started? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And poor Reicher, who went out of business, I think in '99. Finally, they gave up no, the ghost, or '98. Oh, they went out. Of, they went out. Of the oh, actually, it's... three months after Private Parts came out. Yeah. He was obnoxious. Allison Janney, one of her first film he was roles. Disgusting. Do you want me to go and she's on? She's playing Denise Oliver, who yeah. is the woman who teamed up Robin and Howard. That's right. Where he would give a new toilet to the listener with the largest bowel movement on the air. 
I mean, you can imagine the logistics of that. That's interesting because he had them all weigh their shit in serious days and acted like it was something revolutionary. Yeah, he's the crap been doing this forever. Mm-hmm. Right. That's right. Uh, you know, when I look back on this moment in my life, I really wanted it to work. I wanted this to be the biggest moment in the history of entertainment. And is I'm it, not kidding. Is it narration? I wanted everyone to wake the up lowest the morning, form of storytelling at this point Howard in Stern. movies. It's a cheat. Look at those eyes go. I was just going to say crazy, it's crazy kind of eyes. ironic. He's opening it with crazy eyes. Yeah, it looks like a small version of the T Rex's eyes in Jurassic Park. Was Jurassic they opening? Park. But um, yeah, they cheat left and right in this film. Or Jim. It's, it, it's important for people to know that um, they got John Stamos because Matthew Perry, who actually, or sorry, Luke Perry. Luke Perry decided that he thought the movie was going to be a bomb, so he decided not to do it. And that's in the history of Howard Stern, I believe he does say. He does admit that. And if you remember Luke Perry, Howard kisses him. Um, This is one of his many uh, man-on-man kisses on television during this. Luke Luke Perry was also one of the biggest stars in the world at the time. 90210 was gigantic. That's right. Yeah. This is the MTV Awards that Nirvana performed at, right? So is that, I believe it's the same ones that Nirvana performed at. And I remember I did not know who Howard was when this happened because I, ha- I didn't have him in uh, where I lived in Illinois. And I just thought yeah. it was obnoxious. He claims well, in the yeah. movie here. Sorry, he claims in the movie here that he just wanted to be artistic and everybody would appreciate the irony. But he was actually promoting Bartman the movie, which he had announced on Jay Leno one month earlier. That's right. But did my fellow artists appreciate the comedically ironic My fellow artists. What does a rapper have to do with anything with right. this? You know, most of these people are Satan worshiping junkies. These are not Howard style jokes either. To be an inspiration to others. Instead, I'm a joke. Who's going to be inspired by Fart Man? <laughs> now, was the production company that went out of business, Reicher, was that the one that was supposed to do Fart Man? No, no. that was New Line that was supposed to do Fart Man. And New Line Everything was... Is- can you pause for a second? Think about yep. what a burden that is. New Line, uh, the, the head of New Line, used to be uh, Imus' entertainment lawyer. So... Howard met with him back at WNBC trying to get him to be his entertainment lawyer. And the guy said uh, he wasn't interested, but he became the, the, the head of New Line Cinema. And apparently they stayed in touch because New Line was now going to give Howard a movie uh, on this character that he stole from National Lampoon. Mm-hmm. And um, if you look at the National Lampoon White album, there's a track on there called The Adventures of Bartman. And if mm-hmm. you can play it, you will... Be shocked to hear the cadence, the music, the content. Howard stole it all. And the Spartman character had only appeared once before in costume on the Channel 9 show, uh, which had just been canceled. Uh, I guess it was 92, this, these awards, right? So it had just yep. been canceled. So the Spartman movie was sort of a rebound. Like, no, 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 the show wasn't canceled. I'm going to Hollywood to make uh, a huge movie. Yeah. And And supposedly it was the merchandising deal. That's the excuse they gave. The merchandising deal uh, fell through. He He, he wanted control of it. He wanted artistic control is what he says. Yeah. Meaning he wanted to be rated R, I guess. Um, But what really happened was he wanted to be able to own the the licensing. He wanted Mm -hmm. to be able to sell T-shirts in every Mark Fartman T-shirts in every market that carried the, the, the radio show. I'm actually um, sad that this bomb didn't come out. Like, I would have <laughs> loved to mock this. Imagine how bad it would be. Yeah. Well, well he we, talks we about could... it on. He talks yeah. about what the story is going to be uh, a little bit in his in, in Miss America, and it was like him yeah. rescuing a, pro- a woman getting raped at the beginning, and it's, and his by day he's a DJ, <laughs> and it's written by the guy who wrote Pretty Woman. Uh, All I'm trying to do is be funny. And I end up feeling like an asshole. A second ago, you saw Dee Snyder. Yeah, that little little cameo was 
payback for Howard saying, I'm going to put you on my soundtrack and then going, I'm not going to put you on my soundtrack. Um, Howard, uh, there's an article about this online, a post from a guy who knew the, the guy from the band The Zeros. Howard had made certain promises to Chips Enough and to the guy from The Zeros and to Dee Snyder. I'm putting you guys on my movie soundtrack for, as a thank you for everything you've done for me over the years. Mm-hmm. And then he realized, I get a cut of the album sales of this. I want to have Green Day on my thing, not mm-hmm. Snyder's Widowmaker. I want to have typo negative, not the zeros. So uh, it's all Warner Brothers artists, and D got a cameo of looking at the camera. And he wanted a Zeppelin cover by Train on the soundtrack, if I recall, and they wouldn't agree what? to do it. Was isn't that isn't that around? isn't that? I believe I, well, they were they were ninety four ninety five. Yeah, I think they did exist. Is that that was their sort of. Wow. Yep. Yep. Really. Yeah, I believe oh, so. And that that was the bone of contention. He mentioned it on a show. I'll try to find the dig up the audio at some point. We can play it. But um, that was a, a bone of contention. Would, I'm not surprised that he would make the claim. I would be surprised if it was true. Yeah, yeah. That's that again. He says, take right. it with a grain of salt. Right. Howard, it was a home run. This man that he's talking to right now is Don Buckwald. It's not really Don Buckwald, but that's who it, the character's supposed to be. Yeah. And this is where we already start to depart reality, because there is no way that Howard would get on a plane by himself without his agent, without anyone, and then just without his, on the plane. Without his security team? Yeah. Well, him imagining a woman having that too. That too. Yeah. What, in God's name, would a giant chest ballooning out to that be the sexiest thing on earth it's so exactly. that is what he thinks the heterosexual fantasy is and right. by the way, we're looking at a man wearing a wig right now in every single frame of this movie he's wearing a wig even when his hair is the length that it was in real life at the time i was yeah. going to say this hair is it's so manufactured looking. Yeah, it's clear. It's clearly well poofed up and fake, and then he's made up almost the entire yeah. movie. He's got yes. makeup on. He looks like he's uh, been made up by a funeral director, and uh, and you know they. This is the last time. It sort of looks like Paul Rubens and the Lion King <laughs> mixed together. And he looks. He looks like it's. A, he's doing a horrible job of transitioning in this. Like a, he looks like a Jewish Tarzan. <laughs> and it also looks to me like there's more to the front of the plane, so he's not even in first class, we're to, be, we're to believe. It looked like there was way more to the front of the plane. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But in any case, he's not just going to sit next to some stranger without Don, without probably his personal security um, with him. Without his sunglasses. Right. Um. Well, this is my in dad. the the movie, you can hear the song "Mama Look at Boo Boo" is playing. Mm-hmm. Just threw that in as a you know he's going to be a reference. Doing, yeah, he's going to do the character later on. We never played catch or went to ball games. The only sport my father liked was yelling. That's not true. That's not true. Yeah. He took him to he a ball game and he was afraid. Complained. Yeah, he, he right. was afraid. He was afraid a baseball would hit him in the face. I have the and audio he, of that. People, he, he ate too much and got a stomach ache. And yeah, was afraid to go in the trough. And Ray Stern called. He called in and wanted, said he wanted to do karate, and she said he went in for ten minutes. And said I'm not doing this, and left. Right. He'd leave at seven in the morning, get home around midnight or something. I mean, I never saw the guy. Come on, come on. Once a year, my old man would break down and take me to work with him. A little quality time. I like that did little. Did always take them into the city to record things? Lots of times. Yeah, they did. You know, as the movie goes, I hate how they've just thrust us into. Here's the story of my life. It just, it didn't, it feels, you feel cheated. Like, wait, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, how do we get to this? You know, I've always had it rough. This is so over the top and ridiculous. Yeah. And you don't even know what this is. They do we, a horrible we job. We know it was the composite of Symphony. It's supposed to be Symphony Sid. Well, that's what they call him. Yeah. By the Federal Communications Commission. But this is this movie is sort of like a potluck because this seems like something that would be in a Woody Allen movie, perhaps. 
And then there's obviously the abortion stuff. I'm sorry, not the abortion, the um, miscarriage stuff. Miscarriage, but there's a, yeah. the tonal stuff is all over in this movie. Um, mm. And you do wonder, what is this supposed to be? Symphony said, and now something for a blues thing. From that moment on, I wanted to be on the radio. Show business. So we're supposed to believe that Howard wanted to be a DJ because he saw one whipped by his producer. <laughs> that's what, that's what it was just occurred to me. His why father he go, was a I fucking engineer. Producer. Yeah, why don't he say? Why does he say I want to be the guy who tells other men get a, get get your act together, not the guy whose spirit is broken? Right. By the way, fifty five years later, he's still doing sex puppet shows. Yeah. Right. He never did it back then. All of his friends does, on the history does, does, does anybody be, does anybody actually believe he did this at age seven as he as he claims in age nine? No way. His friends well, say it you, never happened. When the Wellmet guy came, um, that no. Camp Wellmet uh, kid was talking about Howard. He said that they had nudie films in the basement, but nothing about nude puppet shows. No. Yeah. Well, at that age, hopefully. Well, then again, at 65, he's doing nude puppet shows. <laughs> yeah, sock puppets, no less. My parents said we're moving to Georgia. They said pretty soon Roosevelt's going to be nothing but nude. Really? My parents said we're moving to Georgia. And no Ellen, by the way, everybody. She's out of this movie. She doesn't exist yeah, as a human. Yeah, this. Right. And this movie gives you the misconception that Howard and his family stay in Roosevelt, which they don't. They would have left yeah. about two years after this scene takes place. Yeah. Uh, he literally makes it seem like he was there for all of his life. Right. The school that Howard goes to high school uh, is has 14 blacks out of 300 students, which mm-hmm. means that blacks were underrepresented compared to the uh, population of America. There were fewer blacks at Howard's school than there were in the population. Absolutely. Percentage-wise. Now it makes it like he's in Harlem. Roosevelt High School. Right. Fully integrated educational. And I think, according to the Colford book, it was maybe 60%. Yeah, there was 30% white uh, when yeah. Howard left. And that was after ninth grade. This is prob- I bet Howard said, Can't I play myself starting in high school? Just so he could be in the seat. <laughs> and I'm sorry. Are locker rooms like this where you're just like parades of cocks walking by, like it's a chorus line? I mean, <laughs> you're going by Howard's memory of it. And he claims that in his industrial arts class, guys would just black guys would just whip out their penises, these rhinoceros penises, as he calls them in the book. And just there, this is his memory of things. And it's, you know, he doesn't remember a thing. And so now we're sitting fantasy. here remembering that he's in his room doing drugs and drinking, which it makes it look like he's the nerdiest junkie ever. So we're supposed to believe this kid with no friends has just this huge stash of weed and alcohol. Get the fuck out of here. And why didn't they have the black guys beating him up? Like that's ogling their penises is the perfect reason to do it. But, uh, you know, he claims that he was beaten up daily for his slacks and whipped with chains. (laughs) None of that happens. No. He goes against his own book. I believe it was Private Parts where he admits he didn't he say in Private Parts it was Polish Polish yes. kids, yeah, that beat him up. The counseling center says there's a communications program at Boston University. Now this is funny, and I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause this right here because we know that we have audio of him claiming that, like, admitting he was a, a horrible student, that he was a horrific student, and that he had to go. Basically, the uh, Boston University basic program of basic studies was, uh, I believe it was for people who wanted to up their average and basically redo the last two years of high school yeah. and to get their grade point average up and ba- and basically then get transferred into a college program. General population. Gen- general population, basically. But he was doing like drama study, not drama, movies, film studies, which was him watching films, etc. So he, he, anybody, anybody saying he's a smart person, just listen to that audio when I right. put it on my channel. I okay. think it is on my channel. I know what you're saying. So in college, Howard became like a 40 year old weird neighbor. Like what is going on? He looks like a porn star. This is a gag that it's, it's a two second gag, but he insists on crowbarring it throughout the whole movie. I would have had somebody else play me at this point still. (laughs) 
you know, no wonder you're getting turned down just walking up to women going, hi, would you like to go out on a date with me? When does that work? And this he's literally is, as tall as a lamppost, and he's thinking right. that he's going <laughs> to... And this is one of those, like I said, the tone of the movie, this blind... This is like Mel Brooks, suddenly. Yeah, it's a cross between Rocky and Annie Hall, and a bit of, so I yeah, a lot. bit of Mel Brooks. Two-time-a-day habit. I'm not proud of it, but I did it. Senior year, big year for me. I finally got up the courage to go down to the college radio station and get myself on the air. Why is it so, like, him, when he talks about how he's honest, why is masturbating and admitting to it the most honest thing you can do? I mean, he constantly refers to that in his books and interviews. I jerk off. Like, well, okay. My, my, I don't know if you want to pause for a second so we don't go too far. Sure. But my theory on that is if he's willing to admit to something that polite society finds embarrassing, but he isn't embarrassed about it, he – the thing that it, it invokes in polite society is we go, here's an honest guy. He's talking about something that's very embarrassing. It's not embarrassing to him, though. I think he gets a kick out of telling people that he masturbates. He's not mm-hmm. going to tell you other things that most people in polite society are fine with talking about, but he would never talk about. Um, but because he talks about things that are very embarrassing, but not to him, he's, he's given this honest man, most honest man in the world uh, title. Right, he's using that as some kind of soapbox on which to to proclaim how honest he is as a human yes. being. Meanwhile, Obviously, he's... I'm honest. I talked about this. <laughs> well, right. now that jerking off has become more of a mainstream, well, I'd say it's not as shocking to talk about. I think that's his right. now most honest thing is therapy. I think that's now what he's saying when he's admitting to going to a shrink four times a week and talking about uh, therapy. That's like his new, I'm so honest I go to yeah. therapy. I miss the days when therapy was talked about shamefully. And it wasn't something <laughs> oh that you go, God, oh, yeah, I'm in therapy three times a week. Uh, it's now boast, something you boast about. Yeah. And obviously, he did not start, he didn't have this Howard Stern radio experience, or, or Stern show experience. He, said he had the... Um, what was it called? The uh, bagel King, Schmalt- King Schmaltz bagel hour. That's right. Where he was not only the least funny uh, in the group, <laughs> um, but he was basically he was... the Robin in the group. Um, and he was also the cl- he was also the clapper. Yeah, essentially that. And you know the famous Godzilla goes to Harlem thing that he talks about in his book. And we were fired on our first. First of all, they weren't really fired. They had thirteen episodes. It was a joke. The firing. And second of all. He's not in Godzilla Goes to Harlem. That's the other guys doing the bit. So while he takes credit for it, he's not actually in it. And this, this and this not- is this is sort of the Animal House uh, ripoff of uh, going into the Fawn Lebowitz sort of uh, sorority sister thing. Yeah, this uh, is sort of inspired by True Life. Uh, although his friends say on the history of Howard Stern, there was no moment like this. Trust me, I was there when they first met each other. It wasn't like this. Allison was connected to a Camp Wellmet friend. And uh, they met before this meeting. There was nothing. And then they meet again years later, and they decide to date. Yes, and there's no mention of Wellmet, even though it takes up such a big part of his life. You'd think he'd want to crowbar yeah. that in. And this He's is so hideous. This is the moment of his life where he uh, gets OCD for the first time, and it plagues him for the next 20 years. It's not in the movie at all. Um, I, of course, because he doesn't really have it, but he claims right. that, that he gets it uh, during this time. TV says it's true. We're all rats trapped in a box, all searching for a piece of cheese. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to shoot it on Saturday. Now this is also a huge lie. This film, he claims in the in the film, it claims to be some kind of film about God, but in real life, it was about TM, transcendental yeah, exactly. meditation, wasn't it? TM is a it's a huge aspect of his life. He does twenty to thirty minutes of TM before every broadcast, and then again later on in the day, he's a devotee. I mean, the Maharishi is his hero, and they decided we're not letting it. We're not going to be that honest, in, uh, you know, about who I am. And I don't know why this Jewish man is making a movie about Jesus, which, uh, but he is. 
I was at the time when this was uh, released. Was he still doing the lie that he's only half Jewish? You know oh, yeah. what? He might have been. You, you know what? He is because, yep. and this shows you, I, I started listening at the right age. I was impressionable. I believed him that he was half Jewish. And whenever he confessed at Sirius, I'm fully Jewish, it was a surprise to me because mm-hmm. I had always known him to be half Jewish. After hearing his parents insane, many times, very, I didn't, I didn't no, have yeah, any doubt. Right. But he always claimed to be Italian. And, you know, as a guy who... I started listening when I was 17. I didn't know all the details. I believed him that he was partially, that he was half Italian. Uh, he loves spaghetti. Uh, so I believed him. And I thought that it was pretty insulting that he had lied about his family's heritage. We well, know now he'd lie about just about anything, including all the 16 wigs he has in this film. Right. But bear in mind, when I watched this, I believed everything he said. Now, I do you think all of Mary these... McCormick's really cute in this, I just have to say. She looks she's adorable. A, she's, she really is adorable, little Irish broad. Now, this is all the, um, according to what I have read, all the buoy bits in this film were improv And And um, there's a, a whole, as I said, there's a work print with a lot of deleted scenes. According to Howard, alternate scenes and deleted scenes, there's about 50 minutes cut from this film. So they did trim a lot of fat to get through it. This gets back to what I hate about the actual product. And that is we now, so we have the Judy, the, uh, sorry, Denise Oliver slash Mary McCormick slash Harry Howard's parents, uh, device of talking to the camera and saying that didn't really happen. It's that we've got Howard narrating it to us and telling us these things happen. And now we've got Gary and whomever he's with saying, Here's Howard going to this. And I just think it's a potluck mess of devices. Mm -hmm. Was this before or after? Because Billy Madison came out. It was after. After. This was after. Because this reminds me a lot of there's these scenes in Billy Madison where it's just like Norm MacDonald and his friend laying on a raft saying like, where's Billy? And then it's like. It has nothing to do with the movie itself. They just keep cutting, or the penguin, or Mm -hmm. these little weird devices throughout the film. But it's actually funny in Billy Madison, where it kind of gels. So I was wondering if maybe he was kind of going by this. Like, look at these little lampposts throughout the film that people seem to enjoy. Mm. I just thought of this as fan service. Um, That there wasn't enough of this in the actual movie. So they said, all right, let's show the weirdos. Same with the thing this, with stuttering think, John the actual, at the end. That yes, exactly. I think that was the actual place where he broadcast from. That building. And this man all, Yeah. He this man uh was hired after Howard was hired. He's kind That's of based right. on a sales a general sales manager. And uh he actually really liked Howard because Howard, unlike the other DJs, hated rock music and punk music and hated about hated the content and he was all too happy to just you know p- play whatever uh the advertisers wants to play that that's one thing that bothered me about the fucking soundtrack because it made it as though oh, i'm a big rock guy when in fact all those years he hated rock he put like seals and croft and carol king and who he did have in studio for or janice ian all these all these um, folksy, folky artists, like <laughs> was it Jay, uh, Graham Nash, all the <laughs> see Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, and yeah. all these light, light folk artists. You got to remember that punk was brand new at this time, and it was, yep. you know, it was not palatable to a lot of people, and certainly not to Howard. So when you see him jamming out to the Ramones, yep. that's not accurate. He wanted the Ramones out of here. That was this, like the CBGB crowd, right, in New York City, yeah. which is nowhere Howard would be. Right. Well, the actual, if you, and you, you can read in, uh, and you can hear it in the history of Howard Stern, some of his coworkers would go to CBGB and check out the punk bands. Howard would never right. go with them. And this, right. too, is inaccurate. Howard was living in a monastery for this first year, a transcendental meditation monastery. You hear, you hear him reference it every now and then where there was no talking, there was no television, no radio. Um, and he talked about it, it a, in the Terry Gross interview that he right, recently yeah. did for the press tour. Right. But it's too out there for him. He doesn't want people to know that about him. So it's not in this. So this, and this is, is and, th- 
this is incredible horseshit because uh, even Meg, Meg Griffin has got a few videos. And she's actually done, said it in many interviews. And even in the history of Howard Stern, I believe they quoted her as saying he was a company guy. He would play whatever they wanted. And the yes. punk was not actually getting the job done, even though uh, Meg and her boyfriend, who eventually lost their jobs, he replaced them as the program manager. Not He wasn't on-air talent, I don't believe, at the time. For was a he? while there, they did not want him to be on-air ta- on talent. It was his dad who said, look, you got to stay on the air. His dad was paying for yeah. vocal lessons during this time, by the way, because Howard's delivery was robotic. You know, we call him yeah. an impersonator, but his yeah. delivery was robotic. And he was, I'm going to say, it was sort of like running with your shoelaces tied together. He was so mixed up from the vocal coaching, trying to be aware of his breathing, trying to make his voice sound deep. He had no, That's why he was smoking, to try to make his voice sound deeper. He, he, admits, he admits later to slowing down his own commercials so that his voice would sound deeper after he recorded them. He was uh, uh, promoted very early on. You know, he starts off making $96 a week here. It only lasts mm-hmm. for six months, I believe, until he's promoted. Yep. Um, but they promoted him. There might have been a couple of reasons that he was promoted. But um, I will say the new owners of the station were Jewish, and Howard mm-hmm. was the Jew- the lone Jewish staffer um, yep. who was willing to work on Christmas, and that's why they hired him. Yep. And uh, Yubi here is Jewish. Um, and I believe they might have trusted Howard for that reason. So I think that might have been why they said, look, he, let's keep this guy. He's responsible. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm only bringing that up because that's something that Howard brings up. When, when Mel Carmazin hires him from w, uh, WXRK, Howard made a press uh, uh, a comment to the press that he's happy to have left NBC and worked with these Jewish men again. Uh, <laughs> so it's always been a factor in his career. Right. You also hear in the music too when he does this, like he always calls them dopey records. I'm going to put on a dopey record yeah. and yeah. he doesn't care about music. No, no he, he didn't then. No, he didn't. In fact, when uh, Elvis Costello came out with the song Allison while Howard was on the radio, so Meg Griffin said, hey, here's a song, here's a record for you. Howard played it and goes, I can't play this. It was too edgy for him. <laughs> <laughs> Allison. You. 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 So, yeah, one of the reasons why they wanted to promote him was to get him off the air. This was a station that had no ratings. It wasn't measured. Um, so they would allow experimental stuff. They would allow guys with no little to no experience to do it. He had to be talked into taking this job because he was working at an advertising firm. He didn't think yep. he thought radio was beneath him because he didn't pay enough. And he also didn't think he was particularly uh, good at it. Bus, yep. The yarmulke right there is the only uh, indication in this movie that Howard is Jewish. The yarmulke is on the other men in this way. Um, wow. They don't reference it anywhere else in the movie that he and Allison and his family are Jewish. Really? Yeah. Okay. It's just a subtle little thing there. It doesn't help that Allison, as played by Mary McCormick, doesn't look no. a, just look even a percentage Jewish. I just couldn't have been happy. You know how he says he was always like excited to kiss her and feel her up? I still don't get that sexual feeling even when he's acting with women. Like I don't buy the chemistry. Yeah. Well, and, he kisses them like a stranger. And his career would be over. I don't know why it's not over. His acting career is over, obviously. But to go yeah. out and just say I would look for reasons to make out with women even when the script didn't call for it and I would grope them and make out with them and put my hand on their breast, that's assault. Yeah. yeah. That's me too. That's that's pulling a Harvey. Yeah. Well, he was definitely the one with the power. He had the control of the script. He had, um, you know, they were there to please him. This is true. Howard actually had to fire the man who hired him um, and was happy to do it. He fires a man named Joe from Chicago, and he fires Meg Griffin. Yep. Meg, Meg Griffin was the, um, uh, the music programmer. She yep. was the one who would uh, you know, get all the records and you know, show them the new stuff. You remember, Howard would just copy whatever Meg played on hers because he had no Basically. interest in music. No interest, no knowledge. Yeah, no curiosity here. Meg later on work starts working for Sirius XM, and she might still be there. Right, she might be. You still love me. 
I gave up my programming. So Allison was going to Columbia at this time to get her master's degree in social social work. Mm-hmm. Wow. She's a lot of people don't know. She's a psych, she's a psychologist. So Howard, who is a slave to psychology now, uh, so to analysis, was married to a person who was probably well aware of some of his problems for decades. And in fact, he is admitted to uh, borrowing some of her her uh, patients' problems and calling them his own on the radio. A wacky morning man at WCCC. I don't support for that. So again, throwing crackhead Bob in just to, for people fan who are actual fans. Yeah, exactly. Look, here's something you can relate to because you haven't been, a- to, been able to relate to any of this horseshit for the last 15 minutes. You know what it is, too? It's Nicole just, Bass. Yeah. It's pandering. It's pandering, and it's just a, these are the flavor of the moment, Whack Packers. Yeah. It's very feminine. And even the filming, look, you... Look at those scenes where they're having Nicole Bass and Crackhead Bob. They don't even look like they're edited together in the movie properly. The coloring of the, the film is, is blue. completely... Yeah, they go blue on them. It's like if you have a filter on your phone and you pick sepia and then you pick yeah. the other filter color. It's it, terrible. This this was the um, the uh, wannabe artists Oliver Stone that they were doing where they're mixing together footage, found yeah, footage. Yeah, J- JFK yeah. style. Yeah. Surprised they didn't have a film projector sound effect going in the background. Now, this is Earth Dog Fred Norris. Right. And in order to get this job, Howard had to beg because he auditioned for it. His, the, the, the guys saw no humor in him whatsoever. In fact, he put other people's comedy on his audition tapes. Robert Klein, Cheech and Chong. He put other people's stuff. When they actually brought him in to Hartford, he failed his audition. He only mm-hmm. got it through begging. Um, so they give him this job after begging. This is where he learns to steal from Steve Dahl. Um, it's in the book. It was uh, it was it was on the air at, at one of his birthday shows. His his uh, general manager or program director, one of the two, uh, was on the show and said, "This is where you learn to steal." And Howard acknowledged that it is where he learned to steal. This is where he listened to Steve Dahl for the first time. This is where a guy who goes from a robot who um, has nothing to say suddenly becomes a guy who's playing the dating game and talk, talking to callers on the phone, which back then the people didn't do on the radio. You would mm-hmm. take those calls off the air, and then you didn't really play them. If you did, it would be an edited thing. Um, he was following the lead of the younger DJ, Steve Dahl, who had just done Disco Demolition and brought 70,000 fans to watch him blow up records. Yep. Uh, that's how huge Steve's career was at that point. And Howard's biggest moment at that point was Showing, uh, showing up to the screening of um, Sergeant Pepper's and uh, giving a, uh, 25 people free tickets or whatever to see the movie. Yeah, Steve Dahl was in the ascendancy. He was as big as he was, uh, pretty much as big as he could ever was ever going yeah. to get, and he National. was a millionaire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you do? Go to the super. So Allison worked for the Jewish Welfare Board. Mm-hmm. Um, Occasional showers and precipitation. Highs near 75. It's going to be raining. Howard will claim that his voice was high pitched because he wasn't being himself and he was nervous from his bosses and stuff. But he was trying to find and avoid using his real voice at all times. Oh, yes. uh, Jerry Seinfeld called him out on that. Uh, I think one of the last times he was in, he said, How do you get your voice like that? Like, <laughs> do, you, do you mean in, in that 1993 interview? This was no. This was like 2012 or 2013 uh-huh. or something like that, right? Yes. Not 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 the comedians in cars special. No. No no no. It's on the air. Oh okay. One of the in, in studio. I can sort of picture where I was when I heard it because I just thought it was unspeakable. You can't talk about that. Well, um, an actual, an actual... through, uh, 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 well, actually, and he went through, he was like, he had to go through the whole narrative about how his voice was so high and tight when he first started. And he started explaining this narrative about his voice out of nowhere, which Jerry didn't even ask for. He just asked him a simple question and he had to go into this long answer that went nowhere, a story that went nowhere. And it, 
liars are the ones who give you all these details. <laughs> too, much, too, too much detail. It reminded yeah. me of the Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor bit where he uh, he's getting busted by the uh, the father of the the girlfriend he's with, knocking on the door. Dur, dur, dur. Well, what are you doing there, Mr. Pryor? Goes, Nothing, sir. I'm just sitting here on the couch with my pants off. Uh, and I think I think if you go into there's a clip on the Howard the actual Howard Stern YouTube site where you can actually hear Robin get on Howard's mic and her voice audibly gets deeper and slower and that's because uh, she, she moves over to show him a text message. Anybody want to look? I'll find the link eventually and put it on the, in the in the display. But it's fantastic because it proves absolutely once and for all that he's yeah. using. Compression and certain settings to make himself sound like a really sonorous, yeah. deep, deep jet voice. The uh, Hartford chapter of Howard's life lasts about 11 months only. I don't know if people realize D- Detroit is only 10 months. Hartford's about 11 months. Yeah. Um, and it's the least um, it's the it, it's the least amount of material in the history of Howard Stern. There just isn't much of him in Hartford. So his biggest thing that he does while he's in Hartford is this to hell with shell campaign. Which yeah. is uh, literally the gas, some, during the gas crisis, right? Yes, and it was a chain letter that was not his was sent <laughs> to him. He reads the chain letter on the air, um, is surprised that he gets media coverage. Although uh, it says in Colfer, Colford's book that he would call around the local Hartford Current and so on. We'll have to pause it here um, to alert them to all of the new things that he'd done, hoping to get more and more coverage. Oh my um, God. Yeah, kind of like was, Beth alerts everyone that she's in a bikini. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was him. I can't imagine what. I guess what I read. A, I read a chain letter today. You're not going to believe it. Oh. Um, so you know what the hell, to hell with shells campaign? It was like people flashing their headlights. Yeah. And he got coverage for this. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it could have been anybody that you were protesting for the high gas prices, but they just chose shell because it rhymes. But right. he also did a thing called a cadaverthon where he said, let's get bodies for um for Yale or whatever it was. Um and you know, he just did bits that were probably taken from Steve Dahl in some form. Mm-hmm. But as it goes on, I'll point out to you things that were definitely unmistakably taken out. But the reason why I want to point you to pause here is because this is a this is one of to me the two scenes in this movie that are unforgivable changes on real life. And mm-hmm. I'm okay with condensing Time, condensing characters, look, you know, it's a story, we've got to keep it moving. Hmm. But when you change the roles around so completely, as they've done here, which is they've taken a person with more power and fame than Howard has and made it so that she's trying to seduce him, uh, when in real life, this is a play on the um, Jessica Hahn thing in, in uh, Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Where Howard's high on after after having beaten Debella in the ratings, right? The zookeeper, he is a powerful DJ at this point. You know, he's the highest paid, probably highest paid DJ in New York. He's just conquered Philadelphia, which means he can now expand nationally. He's really high on himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, he phones Jessica Hahn and says, "Come over into my room and take a bath." And then the boys take turns getting in the tub with her. That's what inspired the whole uh, apology to Nancy um, Mm -hmm. because he brings it up on the air. Jackie didn't want that talked about on the air. Nancy hears this and is furious because like most wives, she considers this wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Getting in the tub, you know, with, uh, with a naked playboy pinup. Um, Jessica Hahn was not that well known at the time. And Howard used his power to get her to come into his hotel room to get his help. Now, in the movie, it's this celebrity who's trying to seduce the young, influent- I mean, young, impressionable, um, barely known Howard. And to me, they've only done it to show Howard uh, is his loyalty was perhaps tested and he doubles down on loyalty. Mm-hmm. Howard was a married father of two when this happened, and he was the aggressor. I will say, though, it is some of the best acting I've ever seen him do, try to act turn on in front of a woman. Uh, if, you, if you really want to go the, uh, the talent, talent route here. She actually invites me to go to a premiere for her movie. I remember how embarrassing it was because nobody knew who I was. I'm and this is just totally fiction. Nothing like this happened in Never. his life. No? 
But who cared? I mean, it was exciting. He wants to be the pretty girl on the red carpet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. They could have found any number of ways to show that he's faithful to his wife. They decide to choose the most flattering way. Well, he and Fred talked one time on the on the air about two girls that picked them, saw them at a, a, a club. It could have been one of the Club Benet shows or so. And no, no, it, it could was have, uh, in a Detroit, radio station. No, I'm sorry, it was in D.C. I believe after their oh. record signing or something oh, like that. Okay, okay. And he said uh, he, they talked about one had a you know a um, an asp uh, bracelet around their ankle or their knee or something like that, and then. Is it uh, a snake? Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, basically they said they were super hot and they wanted to go go take us home. And uh, they turned him down because, well, I'm married, whatever. I think he turned him down, obviously, because he wasn't interested. Yes, and you know what they did when they went back to the hotel? Howard took his clothes off in front of Fred to see if Fred would become aroused. He tells that story later on um, yeah. to Jackie and so on, and they couldn't believe it. You got down into your underwear in front of Fred. He said that you thought Fred might be gay, and he was testing him. This and is years later... Get, this is after you get turned on by two women who want to uh, take you back to their hotel? Years Very... later, the narrative changes. Yes, yeah, Sam? Fred doesn't talk very much throughout this movie. So when he's just kind of following him around during these scenes and like sitting next to him or with him, but he's not talking, it reminds me of like, you know, in the Godfather, when they have people just around that don't say anything, like what, sure. what's the purpose? What? Yeah. This, well, uh, get the him a drink. Of, and this is <laughs> basically to show that Howard would never have gone alone to a woman's room because he's faithful to his wife. Fred, right. by the way, is supposed to be a 21 year old college student in real life at this time. Um, and he's a naive little boy from the country that city wise city boy Howard zeroes in on and um, invites him to sleep over at his house, which he does. Um, they make him look like a resist. chimney sweep from Mary Poppins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think he should be putting in a crappy Cockney accent and just going full Dick Van Dyke? <laughs> oh, my Lord. Oh, my God. Yeah, the Fred character as a character in this movie that's supposed to be real people, except Fred is this Silent Bob type guy, yeah. also is one of those potluck things where you go, wait a minute, well, how does this man fit into this movie? I have to imagine that Howard made sure that Fred's lines were absolutely nil and made sure that he didn't have as many lines as he as he wanted. Yeah. Because it's not about Fred. It's all about him. Right. Why not? Well, for one thing, my clothes are going to get all wet. Well, then I guess you better take them off. I gotta tell you something. You are gorgeous, and, and you're a great actress and everything. But I got a wife at home. I can't cheat on my wife. <laughs> In the wake of what happens after this film or during this film, yeah. this is actually remember he had here. condoms on his list of needs for his trailer. Yeah, during the trailer. Also, let's look at just the magazine promotional covers during this time. All the women in bikinis and the weird naked. Half take, naked photos. Take a look at him when he goes to Cannes with the movie in France. He's right. literally with naked women flanking him, promoting the story of the married man who's faithful to his wife. The pres- yeah. I read that the president wanted his promotional stuff taken down before he arrived at the festival because he thought it was ruining oh, the wow. premiere. Yeah, I read that in a. Uh... It, it was the was that is that fella's website, oh, but it's actually mm-hmm. in in articles where basically yeah, Jacques Chirac said he was going to shoot down the hot hot air balloons that they used to promote the film because they were they they were an eyesore. You know, and, there was a uh, giant they, inflatable Howard that was naked from the ch- like you know bare chested yeah. Howard, uh, bare chested photoshopped around. Howard, yeah. And the, the the crowds, it was the same as when somebody like Johnny Carson would go to to France. No one really knew who he was. No one cared about the film. And going to Cannes, you may as well have gone to the uh, Berlin Film Festival or anywhere else internationally. They were never going to market this outside of English-speaking countries that actually had his show. I'll read it. It says, it wasn't long before three women dropped their tops and posed with Stern. Stern gave the crowd a de Gaulle salute and shouted, Vive la France. Then he went on to explain that he knows only two other French expressions, les femmes sont belles, women are beautiful, and Howard a coucou. A confrontation was averted on Sunday when the private parts publicist 
uh, ceded to the police request to remove a 40-foot inflatable version of Howard that was hovering above the Mediterranean. The reason? French President Jacques Chirac was arriving that evening for the official 50th anniversary celebration of the festival, and sources tell us they felt it ruined the canscape. Like just that. a little. This is so gratuitous. Yeah. You had to earn what? at least a hard R. <laughs> well, because it has to be two men. It has to be a man involved somewhere, doesn't there? Right, Look because it, because women would consider this cheating if it wasn't her ass sitting on Fred's uh, groin over there. Right. Oh, now, man. Had, and the supposedly had a... He supposedly had a real hard on in the scene, and that's why he's doubled over. But I'm thinking, well, that's because Fred's in the tub with him. <laughs> also, too, the eye rolls are so fake looking. Like, I don't know. He just does not look serious about being turned on by that woman. <laughs> yeah. And she doesn't She doesn't look very 1980 right there. But, no. um, you yeah, know, the least of the problems with that scene. <laughs> Now, that was the nightie that ended up in Jackie's suitcase that Nancy Pizza. found. You mean the underpants? Yeah. Right. Yeah, you're right. They're mixed. Look at this. Allison's doing all this work. <laughs> I just had the worst night of my life. I mean, I can't even get to tell you how, how miserable I am. But it's so late. i got to get to bed. I mean, no one realizes i got to be up at 4 o'clock in the morning in that radio station. Everyone realizes. You talk about it every day of your life. Exactly. I just need to rest. I need to get some sleep. I don't know. You know, I know Howard's schedule probably better than like my parents, my sister, like yeah. <laughs> He sleeps 18 hours a day. For having myself and Fred out to her new movie. It was really good. Fred, what did you think of the movie? I was very moved. I think a lot of us were moved last night. CCC AM 1290 FM 107. Howard's not witty enough to say I think a lot of us were moved last night talking about the movement in his pants. Yeah. Or he would have just said it anyways because he was filthy back then with how he well, talked no, not about in women. Not, not in Hartford yet. That's why when he landed in DC, in, uh, DC people in Hartford, and it was starting, he was starting to get attention in New York, people in Hartford were going, this is the same man? That makes sense. Was, was it Hartford or D- Detroit where uh, when they were leaving, uh, he and Allison were leaving to, I think it was to go to Detroit, and they threw a house party, and all the on-air talent who came to the party expecting to be there like 10, 11 when it was really happening, and they found that it was already finished. And those that did show up, <laughs> they were treated to a magician. Yeah, as, that was his leaving, his leaving Detroit for D.C. <laughs> They lived in the suburbs. They were they weren't in the city without the other DJs and stuff. <laughs> they're saying this is the lamest party we've ever been to. So this part, you know, the movie, it's such a bad movie. Here he is telling his wife, "I start tomorrow in Detroit." They live in Connecticut right now. So he hasn't yeah. even told her that he applied for the job, that he accepted the job. They didn't give two weeks to his employer. He's so effeminate, it's not even funny. Radio station in Detroit, we are going to dominate the marketplace. Which I, Did, I have never noticed how flipping gay his gestures are in this. <laughs> yeah. Holy Christ. This it's hard for him to get away I go from uh, out to lunch with my best gay friend. I was going to say, it's like he's with one of the gals and they're just... Yes. Having girl talk. Allison's not coming to Detroit. Can you pause it for a second? Yep. The the real Allison truly didn't go to Detroit with him. Um, she stayed behind for a month because she actually was conscientious and had to give a uh, uh, notice to, yep. to her. You, you know, when you watch this movie, think about it from Allison's perspective. She's constantly being told by her husband, uh, "We're I'm uprooting us. We're going somewhere else now. So you're going to have no job. You're going to know nobody." And it's all in service of my career, which dictates that I get up early in the morning and go to bed at a certain time, and everything has to be just so for me. Yeah. Um, also, too, her very... career would be more solid. Yes. Correct? Look, I, I, thought, I think about this sometimes. 
her resume would be so spotty that she just gets up and leaves. And, and imagine explaining to your employer, well, uh, your p- prospective employer, oh, uh, yeah, my husband works in radio, and so that means we just get up and leave. But we're not going to do it this time, I swear. Uh, try convincing an employer when you've only worked so far for nine, held a job for nine months. You're not going to do it to them. You did it to your other employers. You won't be doing it to them. But so anyway, uh, Ben Stern, not Fred, travels with Howard and gets him set up in Detroit. Allison stays behind with, I'm sorry, Ray stays behind with Allison, packs up the truck and moves all their stuff. That was their role always. The girls had to handle all of the actual physical labor. I believe I'm going to quote Ben. I'm going to quote you, actually. The um, the one thing that Howard and Robin also have in common is they let they left their employers high and dry at a moment's notice. When, yeah. uh, when uh, Robin was still in, I think, Maryland? I'm not sure. Um, it, she was told... I can't remember. We, we 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 discussed it when we did the Quivers of Life podcast. Um, when we read her book, she explains how she le- she basically was told, uh, if you don't sign in with the this particular, if you don't sign on with us, you the job's not on the table. And she'd only been a month at the job she was at before she said, "Well, I left. I didn't even give them a, a week's yeah, notice or two weeks' right. notice. I just quit, just like that." Right. So this is this is a so a bearing constant. that in mind, think of how wrong it is for Allison later into this movie to go, you've been loyal to everyone you've ever worked with, which is what she says. It's all about Allison. Yeah. When, when he and Robin are fake separated, which to me is the other crime in this movie that I'll talk about later. But she says, you've been faithful to every loyal to everyone you've ever worked with. And he, he leaves his employers high and dry on a moment's notice. He's Every leaving time. his wife high and dry. Yes. Think of the inconsideration. Yeah. I mean, she's the one that can have a career based on her education, finds good, steady employment that will most likely master, only right? increase. And he's in the entertainment industry. He's essentially a fucking traveling clown. Yeah, but we're and it's gonna... not really the entertainment industry because he was just spinning records at the time. He wasn't a personality. Yeah. No. But um, he locks but yeah, her out of the limo. <laughs> Yeah. He locks her and his but, child. But that <laughs> part actually in the movie is true to life. He did withhold from Allison the knowledge that the information that he had applied to and accepted a job. Yep. I told my wife everything and admitted the truth because now my wife doesn't even trust By me. By the way, <laughs> can I, I, I should say yep. too, Omar, you'll notice, right. the reason why he even shows up on Detroit's radar is because there was another rock station in uh, Hartford that was gunning for the number one spot. And sometimes uh, radio stations, in order to get themselves in a better position, will get the attention of a consultant and say, here's our competition. You should really get this guy a great job because he's good. So the, comp- so, so the consultant will go, all right, I'll uh, keep this guy on my radar because you want to get any competition out of the market. So uh, Howard was considered good enough that we should get this guy out of here so that uh, we can open up and have the number one radio station. So so a consultant reaches out to Howard for this Detroit station simply because his competition said, reach out to this guy. Mm-hmm. Here you've got this. This is the perfect shot of him ditching. It's ironic. It's, it's, it's symbolic, actually, him ditching uh, – uh, Fred for the job in Detroit because, uh, in actual fact, when Howard later on does do, accept the job at NBC, he and both Fred and Robin get left in the dust. That's right. And he does not care one bit about negotiating for them, and he just says, "I don't know. I'm. Uh, it's nothing." Basically, he had he didn't have them in mind, and I don't believe Never. they were with Buckwald at the time. I think it no, was, it was subs- no, no, no. It was subsequently. Buck, Buckwald is like 85. Buckwald would have been towards the tail end of where this movie stops. That's right. So he left them high and dry. And it, that, that when we get into the Robin stuff, then we'll really discuss that a little more in detail. Yeah. Loyal he's, is the he's not driving Detroit. <laughs> he's crying, trying to negotiate the streets. Oh, my God. And he certainly isn't blasting rock music. Yeah. This character that you're about to see Howard spontaneously invent, Mama Luka Bubude, the black helicopter traffic reporter, 
is directly stolen from Steve Dahl. And they're mm-hmm. having Howard invented on the spot about, um, I'm going to say, six years before it actually happened. And it, when they talk about it on the history of Howard Stern, Gary is as mystified as anyone else. I don't know where that character came from. Howard just started doing it one day, and it was fully realized. Yeah. Howard doesn't do that. So no. uh, Steve Dahl had been doing that character for two years, and it's only the beginning. Howard starts calling a gay movie theater in Chicago called the Bijou at this time. Bijou. Mm-hmm. Howard's never set foot in Chicago, um, has no idea about Chicago. But Steve Dahl calls the Bijou, so Howard calls the Bijou. Steve Dahl, who's in Chicago, calls the Bijou, so Howard calls the Bijou. Um, it's just among the many things that Howard ends up stealing from others, mm-hmm. crediting himself for inventing in this movie. And, you know, for history now, he invented That's what this. I was just going to say. I, now there's nothing to contest it except for the fact that a few of us know him to right. be a thief this podcast and the rest of it, nobody will know. I would love to have access to Steve Dahl's archives and just yep. pull out and say, Oh, here's Steve Dahl's gay character, Rex Reational. He'd been doing it since the seventies, but how are the grease or the grease man, the Vietnam people, vet? Yeah, exactly. We'll get to that too. When we get there, um, it's now, the, the signature characters in this stuff. They're all stolen. And Howard now owns them. He's the inventor of them because he put him in this movie. Now, this is supposed to be the infamous Steve Perry calling him Big Bird and him getting all upset. When Howard was starting out, he was claiming, oh, he, that was a way to treat the new guy. Uh, you know, have, have, give me some respect. What respect did you think you deserved at starting out from the, the starting out from scratch somewhere when there was an established talent already working there? What the, yeah. and, and then Fred later on saying, yeah, that was exactly how it went when Fred wasn't there. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, that, if I could do a sidebar here for a second. Any time Fred and Robin weigh in on the radio business, they have no idea what they're talking about. They're parroting what Howard has told them the radio business is like. They've been under his arms and in his protection, under his protection for their entire careers. They have no idea. They're not in important meetings. They're not dealing with other places. They have no idea. But, um, and at this point, she's, she's pregnant with what? Two kids? No, 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 no. Allison doesn't oh, get pregnant. I remember she didn't even have her miscarriage yet. Oh, okay. um, but I want to keep make you. Keep, I want you to keep in mind he's only here for ten months, and when Howard enters the market, W four is the I think it's the third place rock station in Detroit. Mm-hmm. He gets there, a month, I think it's a month later, the man who hired him gets fired. And a month after that, Steve Dahl syndicates to Detroit. Howard's job right now was occupied by Steve, jo- Steve Dahl uh, a year and a half earlier. Literally that job, working at W4 in the morning, was Steve Dahl's job. So the city instantly recognized, you're doing Steve Dahl. You're taking his mm-hmm. material. And that goes from the radio industry to listeners. You can find message boards where people said, I couldn't believe that he was doing this or that. Um, so it's, so the reason that, uh, they go country, they were, they were facing going country even when Howard got hired because they go, we can't cut it as the number four rock station. We got to be the number one country station. Which so, was which was not which was also not uncommon for stations to just flip and go, let's change formats because right. that might that might change our fortunes. Yes. Right. And you see it all the time with like yeah. Jack FM or um I can't think of any other, but you know, th- that kind of thing does happen. Where mm-hmm. suddenly for example, uh WXRK was a disco station before it became mm-hmm. a rock station. Yeah. So, you know, these things happen. But H- Howard's only there for ten months. He only enjoys about two months without Steve Dahl syndicating his show to Detroit. Steve Dahl announces on the radio that there's a guy in Detroit stealing my stuff. And Howard references that later when he's in New York. He says, I, when I left Detroit because there was this guy in Chicago who stole my material but said to everybody, I stole his material. Can I tell you, as you're telling me this, I'm getting so mad. Like, I'm getting, like, (laughs) like, I feel like heat rising in my neck. Like, I feel like I might break out in hives. Like, I'm getting very upset. Yeah. Well, if if they released this, if they released this today, 
uh, let, let's say it was expanded to include his uh, more recent events, you'd think it was science fiction, this entire film. And the, that's, that's, I guess, what, if you're a long-term fan, especially in 1997, the reason why it didn't perform was because people knew most of it was bullshit. There's dramatic license, and then there's outright nonsense because you know the real story and you've been yeah. a fan since Washington or however long. But think now, about I this for now 2020. Real... We're still, he's still doing this shit. Well, there's yeah. Not, yeah, there's also, there's not a week where this movie isn't referenced on, by him yeah. on this show. Oh, um, right. And, and sometimes it's a guest will go, I watched your movie. I loved it. And you go, how could you love it? It's not a well-made movie. It's a very crappy 90s artifact. It's a very 90s movie. Um, oh, absolutely. Even though it doesn't take place in the '90s, it's an art. It's a '90s style movie, in a, in a, in a bad example of a '90s style movie. But yeah. um, while he's there, he does a couple of you know he has this uh, leather weather lady dominatrix thing. He acts. Mm-hmm. By the way, if you listen to the history of Howard Stern, very afraid of sex. So if somebody else brings up sex, he's like, whoa, 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 that kind of guy. You know, he's not the. Uh, lascivious frothing guy who imagines every woman with G cups that we see in the airport that he's nervous. He's however, he would, inc- he would insist constantly. I remember it because I have all the clips, uh, that David Letterman was the guy that was really, uh, put off by when you mentioned something sexual on the air and he'd be whoa 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 well that is true but it was equally true of him but he would have you believe he'd have you believe he was you know the sex the sex guru and yeah etc right kill 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 the white man by eugene mama look a booboo day this by the way is the only racial humor you will hear in this movie if this even counts as racial humor right howard's whole identity was racial humor in the 80s. That's what you knew him for. He was Archie Bunker, who does racial comedy, who talks about gays, who uh, talks about women. None and of that stuff's in here. There's a, YouTube channel, there's a YouTube channel with a clip where they edited every single use of the N-word they could find into a collective, <laughs> just like yeah. the scar- edited Scarface, just down to the, the fucks. And they did the same thing with the N-word. And it was it dates from... God, at least from 10 years ago to early days. And he always used it. Yeah, they use it in this movie. He's the little boys in the background are the ones saying it. It's like, I have yep. to be around it. It's got to be said. I can't say got, it. That's right. They've, they've shaved his mustache off. Oh, did they, just, they shaved his mustache off in the last scene, didn't they? I think so. And then it's back? Anyway, I think they just showed him with his mustache gone and then back. But uh, they shave his mustache about... Uh, Four or five years too early. It didn't actually come off in Detroit. Too much. And very important. I want the time and the temperature four times every 15 minutes. Not three. Four. My grandmother died last This bit that he's doing right now about his grandmother dying is what he would do when he would enter a new market for (laughs) sympathy ratings, he believed. He's going to tell everybody my grandmother died. And Ellen, his sister actually thought something was wrong when she heard him doing this. Um, so in the movie, he's honest. He's trying to be heartfelt. But in real life, he did it as a scam to try to get people to uh, listen. He doesn't have a sister. <laughs> right. <laughs> she, she doesn't exist. The thing that I noticed when I watched this, for the, and I haven't watched this movie very many times, I have not watched it in four years, five years, is that the more honest and himself he becomes on the radio the faster and longer his hair grows. It's like a Pinocchio type thing. The more honest you are, the more and faster your hair. (laughs) When do you think he started wearing the hairpiece? Because as I look through, like, you know, the middle of Miss America and stuff like that, I don't think it was just when this movie started. I feel like it was was way earlier, like during the Channel 9 stuff. I think it was for certain occasions you would see him switch to this is just my thing for the grammy awards for example if there's a, if you ever look up howard stern grammy awards new york it's where he's in a costume as a man who's a, a biker basically he's got the um sunglasses on and the leather uh, motorcycle jacket that looks like it's got to be painful to wear because it's never been worn that kind of thing <laughs> uh i believe he might be wearing a thing there and for certain high-profile things, photos, um, I think he does wear something. But I think there's always, 
I do believe a system is what's going on here. It's always, I don't think it's ever just flat out wigs, except for in the movie here. Right. Yeah. I think it's a mix of things. I think and someone posted it. Someone talked about it before, I'm sure. But he, I think after this movie is when he got really comfortable saying, look, I'm I, there, I, having professional Hollywood hair pieces put on his, on his dome. He got really comfortable with the idea of changing it up a little bit more. So all of a sudden, uh, he was more comfortable wearing wigs and being out in pieces. And if the, you look at the Gary Busey video, the wrestling video, yeah. that, there's, I'm, I'm sure that's a hairpiece. I'm sure that's extensions yeah. and a hairpiece and netting. And then whatever the technology of the time allowed him to get away with the best possible, because he had money to burn. He could easily get the most expensive. Yeah. And um, he just got more and more comfortable with fake hair at that point. And interestingly, you know, all know the name Tony Coburn, Howard's personal yep. hairdresser. He met yeah. her in the wig department of private parts. It's wow. a weird. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, and she I believe was what, low on the totem pole. And I believe the uh, contract stated first priority to the artist, hairstyle, hair and makeup, <laughs> whatever for, future, for this film. For future, yeah, contracts that he entered. There's the only yeah. funny part in the movie, and I'm not laughing. Yeah, you're not going to laugh at this. I mean, you, there's no surprise to it anymore. But this is not the same movie. I mean, it's it's a gag thrown into another movie. It's it's very weird. Yeah. And ultimately, it's physical comedy where you're not expecting. It's supposed to be about something a little smarter. The real Howard would have just kept throwing the frisbee at him to torture this man because he really likes. Look at how fast his hair's grown since the last scene. I know. He's been for ten months, you guys, and look how long it's gotten already. <laughs> but that's because he was honest about something on the radio. Starting a new format, and it'll give us a real great edge. That is hilarious if you think of it that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh my God! Look at him now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like halfway down his back. He, he, he couldn't wait. He could. He couldn't wait to make it longer. So he, I think he, ex- uh, yeah. he told them, "I want it longer for the next scene." Yeah, it's a clue that he's been honest about something. Every time he said that, um, this didn't really happen in real life. He did this off the air where he made the joke, "Oh, you guys all fuck your dogs, don't you?" Or whatever it was, making fun yeah. of people who like country music. But he didn't come up with the name Hop Along Howie either. He didn't call himself on the radio. Somebody else called him that, and he, and he stole it. Yeah. He has such a weaselly face in this movie. Oh, so can I just really quickly say? Yep. Uh, so the country, the station did go country. Um, he did get the uh, show up on the recruiter, uh, Denise Oliver's radar again. Or, or the recruiter, recruiter introduced him to Denise Oliver. He goes and interviews for it. But then he says... I've only been in Detroit for 10 months. I promised my wife I was not going to do this to her again. So I can't do it. So then he he wanted to live in D.C. That was great, but I can't do it. So he goes back. The reason why he couldn't just simply go to another rock station in Detroit, because there were others, um, is because everyone in Detroit knew he was a Steve Dahl impersonator. Mm -hmm. So he literally had to flee the Midwest and go to the East where no one knew what crimes he was committing. That's right. Um, and so he returns to the Northeast. Well, not the Northeast, the East. He's the Ted Bundy of radio. My he returns to the East with a bag of stolen identities. Absolutely. Uh, that nobody in Washington, D.C. knows about. There is right. one caller on um, the history of Howard Stern while he's in D.C. who is congratulating him for his new ratings, I believe it is. And they said that I don't know the name of the stadium there. They said, uh, oh, next thing you need to do is go to the stadium and blow up some records. You'll be as big as Steve Dahl. And he just kind of yeah. goes, uh-huh, like that. So that's how nationally known Steve Dahl was because of that stunt. But they didn't know. No one knew what Steve, right. what, what Howard was had taken from Steve Dahl. And it's not just a simple traffic helicopter thing because, like I said, that didn't come around until 86, It was multiple bits. It was multiple it was, bits. It was, this is my personality now. It's yep. the – you listen to if if anyone knows Steve Dahl and grew up like I did listening to Steve Dahl, you can't listen to Howard from let's say eighty five or six and not hear Steve's cadence. The way Howard tells a story is the way Steve Dahl told a story. The way that he would pause and and say just as few words as possible sometimes was the way Steve Dahl did it. It is 
I'm sure anyone who knows Steve Dahl, like the way I did in the 80s, you would listen to that and go, oh, my God, they are – it's exactly the same. So Howard has had many radio identities from voice change to cadence change to um, sense of humor, style change, everything. But Visual. But the reason he had to flee Detroit and the Midwest is because he was a known thief. And because he was years away from syndication, no one would be wise to it until, well, way later if anybody had clips or tapes that they recorded and uploaded them. And right. there might still be out there. I'm going to try to do a little deep dive on that. fantastic to find Steve's stuff. Yeah, and then also just compare it to mid-'80s Stern or oh, even early-'80s. Yeah. No, I mean, no, a lot of times I'm just holding back. So this but whole see, on- yeah. So now he's making it seem like oh, I wasn't giving my all, but in reality he fled because he's a freaking yeah. copycat. Right. Yeah. Sexy. His wife's imagining, well, how long is your hair going to be? How honest are you planning to get anyway? But um, he's so when he was uh, so sorry, I'm just getting kind of distracted by. <laughs> the, these are the transsexuals. Trans, are, are, what are they? Uh, are they drag queens? I don't, or I, I have no idea. I don't remember in the because they they did talk about this particular filming this scene. Um, but yeah, they look like they look like transsexuals. I, I, they, yeah, they're tall. They're <laughs> they're not they're not transgendered, right? No, I don't, are, I don't believe. I, I thought they were drag. Queens. I'm not exactly sure, but. That person in the middle, the blonde, shows up in the Miss America uh, special that they made for E. Um, she was the one who got Howard in his drag costume for um, for the book, which uh, he was fascinated with drag queens at this time uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and uh, the trans. Remember Tula? Uh, Tula the transsexual. Fasc- yeah, he was fascinated with them. And so, um, anyway, I got thrown off of what I was saying about Steve Dahl. But anyway, just to quickly say, it's not just traffic helicopter. And it's not even just the way he speaks. It is the identity. It's him confessing to having a small penis, which Steve Dahl had already confessed to. Howard doesn't mm-hmm. confess that, by the way, until, like, the 80s also, if you listen to the history of Howard Stern. It's mm-hmm. um, putting your wife on the air and having your domestic life be the entertainment. Steve Dahl did that first. Steve Dahl did that, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's not just a simple thing. It's everything. Really looking forward to working with you. It's great to meet Now, in her book, Robin will tell you that when she first met him, she knew he was going to be a superstar. But there's nothing at him to him at this time to indicate that he'd ever be a huge star because he's at this point just a serial copycat. Yeah. Apparently, she says she heard him talking to a prostitute as if she was a real person, interviewing him like she was just a regular person. She said, I have to meet this guy. Yeah. Um, Howard has always shamed these people, but he convinced Robin that he was actually just treating her like a real person. The mythology but, um, of this is so incredible. I mean, they just invented their own history as this yeah. has gone along. Well, yeah, they actually spoke to each other on the phone and then went to a dinner before this. But Howard had uh, lost his voice, apparently. And so he said very little at this dinner. Um, you got to look at footage of Howard from this era. He's among uh, about the closest to the fattest he's ever been. And wearing sweatpants to work every day, short hair, mustache. D. Snyder uh, talks about that when he uh, he went b- busted in his dressing room and said that he saw this geeky looking account, guy account, and was not account, expecting look like an that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He said not the brains to be an accountant. But uh, <laughs> uh, Robin had the very short uh, hair, you know, like two inches off of her Grace head, all <laughs> sort and, of and more like a Lewis. And she wasn't put together. <laughs> and at this point, at this point, she was still. I don't remember. It was um, the the Mary the Mary Beth, the evil character in Robin's book. Was she part no, of their that's setup? NBC. That's later. No, I'm when sorry, she's, that's, that's, that's NBC. Okay. Yeah. This one is. There's still Denise Oliver he, there. That's Alison Janney's character. But. Right, right. And uh, he. This is where he gets the think tank, which is Who? so. Uh, let me just fill you in really quick on the history okay. of radio here. This is when morning zoos take off. The, I'm sorry, the morning zoo in Tampa yeah. takes off. Scott Shannon's Morning Zoo in Tampa, where he employed something like 70 people, which Howard now does. But they had like 70 people, 
And it was the new thing in radio. Mm -hmm. Clapping, laughing, a group of guys having a party. That was the new thing that was invented. And Howard with this group of guys called the Think Tank, which were um, unpaid uh, listeners. They weren't comedians. They were just Mm -hmm. listeners. One guy was an attorney. Um, They came in unpaid once a week and would cackle at everything Howard said, um, give him yo mama jokes. To, I remember to, yeah, the, this. The, yeah. the rank outs. Rank outs. The names. Right. The, I don't know if Al Rosenberg was there at the time or if he was a little later with the Channel 9 that show. Was, but, that was at uh, NBC. But Steve, Jaco- Steve Jaconis yes. is the name yeah. that, 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 mm-hmm. that comes in. And he's in the, um, as Ben likes to call it, the Hater's Handbook, the Paul Colford unauthorized yeah. biography of Howard Stern, right. which everybody, we, at one point, that's going to be a future project, ladies and gentlemen, where we take apart that book and not take it apart, but actually give it full, full focus and it is really a explain. Fantastic. I, there's yeah. YouTube clips of that Yo Mama thing where they go around and they each try to outdo each other. Uh-huh. Yep. It's embarrassing. Yep. The listener comes up with one, and then one of the guys in the uh, think tank hands Howard something to say back to them because Howard's not thinking these things on his own. No. In fact, Ralph, of all people, when not Ralph was an 18-year-old listener in New York, calls Howard out and says, why is it taking you so long to come up with your uh, insults? <laughs> um, you know, people are writing those down for you. Um, so anyway, Howard has always, my, my point is he, this is where he starts copying a morning zoo, which is what his show really truly is. It's a morning zoo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that this is more of an X-rated morning zoo, but it's a morning zoo. This is where he learned about it because this is what was going on in Tampa and lighting the radio industry on fire. So Howard introduces clapping. Um, he starts doing the drum sound thing, you know, after making jokes, um, having guys laugh at everything he says. And, of course, Robin laughed at everything he said. That is true, too. I didn't consider that. Why don't you give me a call? We should also point out when Denise Oliver did meet uh, uh, Robin, Robin admits that they started arguing with each other. So Robin is not a particularly easy person to get along with either. And that's yeah. one thing this film really, really doesn't take into effect, the, the take into take into consideration. Yeah. Both of them were incredibly hard to deal with, and hey, people hated negotiating with them. In her book, you know, they present this united front in the movie. But in her book, Robin says she she gives an interview when she leaves because that's what I'm getting at is the second unforgivable crime in this book is Robin's departure. Yeah. But mm-hmm. when Robin leaves, uh, she gives an interview with, I believe it's Washingtonian, where she says she accuses Howard of always lowering her mic so that he gets to do all the talking. And she accuses him of being racist. Um, and if you remember in her book, she talks about jogging on his picture, I guess it was during this era, she believed him to be a racist and she also believed that he hated women. Um, she didn't like the way he talked about women or two women and he doesn't like women. Um, Robin was right. Her instincts were right. Um, but a lucrative career made her convince herself she was wrong. Mm hmm. Temperatures for veterans marching in parades across the metropolitan area. Now, here's where he's about to invent the grease man's bit. Yep. You know, Robin, uh, let me interrupt for a second. I'm glad you brought up Memorial Day. You know, I was in Vietnam. I'd like to talk to you about it. I had 11 kills in Vietnam. And I'm telling you, I really should have had more. Officially, I should have had more so kills. So this bit that he's doing is stolen from the grease man who replaced Howard when Howard left. And continued to get the ratings Howard got, even though Howard will tell you that it bombed. That's not true. That's not um, true. Yeah. In fact, when Howard's show was syndicated back to D.C., they found the Grease Man was so unbeatable that the only way to make Howard number one was to hire the Grease Man and pull him off and put him on their own station at night. That's right. Which was a common tactic amongst yeah, radio stations. You, they you basically buy your first place medal. Which is what they did. Yeah, so, yeah. Your competition gets bought out. So the Grease Man had been doing this character, Sergeant Grease Man, where he puts together these very well written little radio plays that are sort of like uh, chapters from his war journals, and it's him telling the story, and you hear the sound effects of here I was in the situation, and I've only heard I don't know I've heard fifteen of them because they were on his website. They are on his website, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they are really well structured they start with a thing they lead up to a thing and they often involve grease sergeant grease man heroically recalling 
wiping out his own his own troops, um, turning you know he's always uh, um, casting a very terrible situation as a sort of like heroic win. So it's it's funny, it's really funny. Yeah. And Howard spontaneously again in the nineties invented my time in Vietnam where I was rip- and Howard made it Howard by calling them gooks. And that was his thing. And none, yeah. and that was never funny either. Like no, when you no. listen, it's very cringy. Yeah. Right. It's inherently, it's inherently racist and which is, which is what he is at his yes. heart. And the only he thing that does have tol- racist feelings. The only thing that made it tolerable. And I would love to do this film more some time, some time, Jim mm-hmm. is take, Classic era Stern stuff that we find funny now. Mm-hmm. Remove Jackie laughing from that and just leave it be silence and see if you find yourself laughing. Or are you laughing because Jackie's laugh triggers in you a laugh response? And I do believe that hearing people genuinely laughing and enjoying themselves, as Jackie always seemed to be doing, made you feel like what he was doing is actually funny. And it's yes. not. Uh, right. It was a laugh track. No, it's no different than a Pavlovian response but in a I, sitcom. But I will say, Robin's laugh never has that impact on me. But Jackie's laugh did make me think that what was happening was actually funny. Because it was always muffled, and it was in the background, and it was uh, the same way if you've ever heard the Porky Pig doing Blue Christmas, and you hear the engineer laughing, that's when you lose it as well. Because it's it, just out of, out of earshot. It, I, I mean, the few times... During the post arty years that I actually laughed at the Stern show, usually it's because Benji laughed at something, and I hear Benji laugh at something, and I'll go, "What did they just say?" And I realize, "Oh yeah, he's he's laughing at the irony of something, or yes, something that no one else in the studio could possibly get." Okay, so this is a tribute because he loves Mad Magazine. He's throwing it in there. Okay, he's reading it, but that's about his education level. Nobody his age should be reading Mad Magazine. No. <laughs> You know, when his book stuff came out, you guys, how old were you when his uh, private parts? And I, I read it when I was 17. So I was 18 in, when it came out. Okay, so in your mindset as a 17 and 18-year-old, you're maybe reading this thinking it's funny because you're 17 or 18, realizing that a 40-something-year-old man is writing this stuff in the sense of he's very, well, that's very funny. immature. Well, that's like, funny. I am horrified. As an adult. Yeah. Well, that's With children. It's funny because so when I was 17, I had I became a super fan within a half an hour of being exposed to his show. Really. Mm-hmm. I was moving from Illinois to Las Vegas and staying in hotels during this week long drive. I got exposed to the E channel for my first time. I remember seeing on E channel it's showing Ralph and it said under his name Barry Face Queer. Which was, to me, I was a huge Jerky Boys fan. Um, I had never seen something like that on television before. I had I responded immediately to this group mindset of guys bashing other guys, one another, their friends. Mm-hmm. I responded to it immediately. And so I would say within one month of uh, hearing him, for the, seeing his e-show for the first time, I was reading Private Parts. Um, I was waking up early intentionally in Las Vegas because I could hear him now. I couldn't hear him where I left in Illinois. I, would, I could hear – so I was I was immediately a fan, a super fan of his. I loved everything that he did. Now, I didn't – my my education didn't go before 1994. So when I read Private Parts, it was all new to me. But like you just said, it's not – it's sort of a 40-year-old man writing this book, or at the time he was 38, I guess. But – it's made into a book that's readable by a savvy New York woman, Judith Regan. And Ratso Sloman. And Ratso Sloman, who wrote for National Lampoon and edited National Lampoon. So it's it's taken it's taken what they did was create a concept of who Howard is. And then Howard said, Yeah, that's who I am. But that's not, you know, they together the three of them created the Howard Stern identity that uh, he could never have created on his own. Mm-hmm. 
See, that's see, I and Ben knows this, of course, but most of our listeners wouldn't. I started out. We didn't get Howard Stern in Canada until the late '90s. Well, I think '97 they had it for a year in Toronto, and we, which I, could, I was hours away from Toronto. We couldn't catch it, and um, Montreal, I believe, for less than a year. It didn't last. Uh, I think because Canadian audiences, first of all, were too smart for that, and second of all, they they could just it just didn't catch. And, was there a uh, censorship, um, freedom of speech thing too? Not that I know. There might have been some complaints, but I think, in all honesty, it was ratings. I don't believe he could okay. he could crack into it. And um, so w- w- the only thing I could hear was see was the E show or the Channel Nine shows when I would see them by accident, really. And then the late uh, the later show, the one that competed, I think that was the E show. Was it, is this the E show, the interview show? Oh, you saw the interview show. So that's uh, okay, in, that's before occasionally. the. So that's before the nightly show that we all – the radio show yeah. on at night. So you saw that when he was doing those cringe interviews. That too, but I saw those occasionally and I didn't know what it was. It wasn't until the book came out that I go, oh, that's that guy because I saw this very garish, you know, really lime, like neon color uh, ja- dust jacket. And I go, okay, well, what, the, what is this? And it was in the comedy section and it was huge. It was selling a lot. Yeah. My mother read it even. Like imagine this off the boat Greek woman reading this book and fi- like uh, reading this stuff and uh, <coughs> uh, laughing, laughing at some of it, just how, how outrageous it was. So I did – check it out and then i thought like you ben that if this was howard he's very funny but once you start once you start seeing him on talk shows when he did make these appearances you cringe and you go this can't be the same guy he's not funny he's not entertaining yeah. he's a blowhard yeah. so i had to backwards like retroactively get bits and find out who the jesus twins were or who uh neil nicole bass was once because once you get them the first time or the, the second time or whether they're well established you don't know who they are but then to start getting into the history of it all then it, you put all the pieces together and you realize my god what a what a patchwork quilt this is yeah yeah, yeah. at any rate this this scene makes me laugh because it's it's Mary McCormick uh, getting undressed in front of him and he's getting all he's all ramped up. I have a feeling Ralph is somewhere off camera naked to get him motivated. Yeah, I have a theory that this whole it's baby time. Howard was forced to become a father. Oh yes. Was, thought it was the luckiest day of his life when she miscarried, which she just which she has done twice. Um, and his mother even miscarried before he was born. But uh, I don't believe he ever wanted to be a father. Um, and I believe that this was a sort of concession. I've been ruining your career. You have a master's degree. Uh, I've been telling you that we're going to settle down. We don't do it. Fine. Uh, we'll try to have a baby. I'll go and you one years further. longer. <laughs> oh, yeah, because he was very honest the day before about Vietnam. I'll go you one further. I don't. I think, and this is just conjecture, everybody, but I think all three of his daughters were in vitro babies because I've heard people make. The, I I haven't speculated on how they yeah, were conceived. We have, we have no way of knowing, but it no. would make to me it would make perfect sense because he had the money at the time, which was super expensive, still is, and um, he seems to have no interest in vagina. So this scene here, uh, that's my favorite part. That, that's my favorite one you debunked. <laughs> right, okay. This takes place about four years later in uh, New York, not in D.C., and it's a soccer bomb with a clock radio, and she doesn't get <laughs> naked. Uh, she moans a little bit, and I, I used the clip for something else in the Howard Stern's voice over the years because that day he was introducing a new voice, and the callers were not having it. They were, the woman goes, I don't like this new voice because he was <laughs> trying to make his voice sound deep. And then he breaks it for a second. He goes, well, I never really had a deep, I never had a good voice. And she's like, you're a <laughs> normal voice. So anyway, what he's doing is not this whole whoo, humming thing. He's going like, bah, making this bleating goat sound. That yeah, he, sound, he sounds <laughs> like a goat with epilepsy. It's, and, and, but he, even He's, now, though, he says, like, this is really what happened. He now says that this is the story. Right, right. Well, I right. I do believe that he now believes this is his life. I think <laughs> that before his old age, he will have been a Vietnam super soldier, as he remembers it. Uh, <laughs> because he now is a survivor of abuse as a boy, um, you know, at the hands of Black people, which I still can't believe people let him get away with this, this day and age, is just saying, well, you know how black people are. You live near them. You're going to get your ch- your pants stolen. You're going to get 
whip with chains. I think one time Bill Burr, because his wife is African American, said, yeah. "Are you still going with that?" Like, <laughs> is that what he said? Yeah, no, on the show. Yeah, he did. He did. He goes, oh yeah, he, he was kind of ba- he was making that. he was making wait, wait, light. Wait, wait. It was very recent. How was the last said appearance. that about Bill Burr's wife? Is that what you're saying? No, Bill Burr was on the show. Oh, asking said, him if he's still going with the bit about yes. abuse. He's like, that. you're still going with that? We're still complaining about this? You know what? Yeah, that's a good real world question because you shouldn't be so consumed with that in your 60s. This Look is so horrible cutest. Good job. This is the woman who Big Pussy says from The yeah, Sopranos past, that Howard slept with. Story. Teresa yeah. Lynn. Yeah, Teresa Lynn. He goes, Teresa Lynn said you banged her on the set of Private Parts. And Howard and suddenly he, goes, who? Oh, yeah. And then, he, oh, yeah. That, and that's like his standard Ralph defense. What? What did you yeah. say? Right. Give me time but you to come back. His, you know that he knows her name because when he did the live tweeting, back when he signed up for Twitter, the live tweeting watch of this, someone asks who's that blonde and he answers Teresa Lynn. So he hasn't forgotten. Yeah. I mean, a decade no. later, he hadn't forgotten. Right. And the hair just gets thicker and thicker. Yeah. It's incredible, actually. It's not even subtle. No. No, you don't. (laughs) Back then he did. Back then he and Robin were um, pigging out as Roy Rogers. Yeah. They double Chinese. Jack Jack in the box. Yeah. This guy. Total personality. He's electric. Yeah, this, this, so he's only in DC for 18 months. Mm-hmm. And in that time, he loses his producer who was called Earth Dog something. I don't remember his name. So then he's decided that Fred's going to be Earth Dog Fred because Howard creates nothing. The producer before him called himself Earth Dog. We're going to call Fred Earth Dog. And if you listen back to the Earth Dog stuff, I, I, I've, uh, you know, I've introduced you guys to some of it before. It's so cringe because Fred is playing this character who talks like, I'm not doing that. No. And, and this is where Howard claims to have invented reality radio. And yet yeah. one of the guys he's interacting with is playing this puppet the whole time. And mm-hmm. did people not think it was weird that this guy who talks like this gruff dog suddenly has Fred's voice? Or did that just get skipped right over? Uh, I don't think – well, they didn't call him uh, – they, they went by Fred. So it, was, it went from, say, Earth Dog Brian or whatever it might be to Earth Dog Fred. Uh, so they weren't trying to pretend it was the same guy. And I don't know if the guy before Fred had a gruff voice or Fred just decided – uh, I'm going to be creative here and make up a gruff voice. Yeah, that was Fred's head writer. That was head being Fred being a head writer right. before he was a head writer, making and a le- creative decision. And let me tell you how totally blown out of proportion this is. So Howard does what's called the lesbian dating game when he's in Detroit. Because mm-hmm. he would always do the dating game, which Steve Dahl did. So Howard did, it was one of his signature bits, the dating game. And he is remembered as being doing the first ever lesbian dating game. The only problem is Howard didn't want to do lesbian. He wanted to do gay dating game. And his oh, wow. Denise said, let's make it lesbian. That's easier for the audience to swallow, basically. So he goes, okay. He brings the woman in. You listen to it. It's just you know, polite question, polite question. But then he'll sometimes work in some digs like, and you don't all wear combat boots, do you? Things like that, because he's got to um, show I'm not t- accepting of these people. I'm just, you know, but he was credited for being woke and for um, breaking boundaries. And he, wasn't he called really... himself the gay savior. Yeah, he did. <laughs> right. So <laughs> even was... though even though it was something that was curable, according and, to him in both books. And so it was Denise Oliver, essentially, who told him, you love lesbians. You're obsessed with them. Oh, I am. I thought I was obsessed with gay men. Okay, I'm obsessed with lesbians. Wow, I, it's it's dizzying. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I want it to be. <laughs> Hi. I can't believe it. This is, uh, okay, so Allison calls in to tell him good news. Uh, we're having a baby. I and Howard, what takes it on the air? I'm like flipping out too. I'm somebody's father. Oh my god. 
Love him or hate him, unconventional disc jockey Howard Stern. Jumped to the top it's amazing how he retains that femininity the whole way through. You really? Never, like, oh my God, you, okay. I'm going to be a father. Yeah. <laughs> Can you believe I've impregnated a female? Totally overjoyed. I mean, we were going to have our first child, and six weeks later, the new ratings came out. We destroyed every other station in the market. My life was perfect. This is fiction. When was he ever massaging his wife's uh, on the couch with her at any I'm time? Surprised he's not pushing her downstairs. But he can't take his eyes off of himself on television, which is accurate. You know, he didn't yeah. have to act for the scene. Um, but uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm glad that they put this in there because it's an important part of Howard's life. The fact that he treated his wife's miscarriage, his child's miscarriage, the miscarriage like, of his own child, like as a, a joke, as a joke to be laughed at, uh, it's there. I mean, it's when you listen to it, you, you can find it on YouTube, or you mm -hmm. could. You're listening to it, going, "This was real. I can't believe this was real. That yeah. that he was okay with making jokes." about taking the droplet in the jar to the zoo and all that other kind of stuff. You just go, this is a sociopath. And now the this worst part about it is when he talks about the miscarriage and they say, how could you do that? He flips it on its head and says, I'm sharing everything with my audience. This I is me hair. being <laughs> honest and it's sick. Yeah, right. This is not... That is your child. It's not, yeah. you know, it's, it's not so my wife's child. <laughs> it's not, yeah, it's not something that my wife has to deal with. That's your kid that you were already thinking about a name for and a future for and so on is now gone. But and even go, when they were present, alive children, there was three of them. It was my terms. I saw my kids on yeah. my terms. I, yeah. he treated this like, this is Allison's problem. And when he did see his children, he made sure that it was perfect. It couldn't be uh, it, when he was bothered one time when he had to go to Long Island and had to talk with his kids and Allison, he was livid that he even had to do one ounce of parenting yeah. that wasn't fun. Yeah. Ben, Ben, was it yeah. you that was it you that quoted him in his own book saying something like to out when speaking to Allison that. Uh, you were told me when we had this third kid that I wasn't gonna have to fucking yes. put up with this shit. Yeah, like I, she like had this... asked him to watch the baby so she could run and take a shower, and he said, right. "Get the housekeeper to do it." She says, "The housekeeper is sick." He goes, "Hire a fucking army of housekeepers." You told me I was not gonna have to de deal with this. Meaning, watch my own child while yes. my wife takes a shower. Yep. And then later on, it's in the serious years, and I have, I'm sure I'll pull up the clip eventually on my channel, but Robin explains that he was not allowed to be with his own kids without the housekeeper. Like, they didn't trust him to tr to look after his own kids. No, I wouldn't he's gonna look either. At <laughs> he's yeah. a sociopath, yeah. And this is, I love this scene because it's actually like human impersonator Howard actually mouthing a script saying, you know, this is, this was good. You know, your body rejected it because your body wasn't. You're totally confident that everything's going good because. You know your body would reject it if it was. We might have had a whack packer. So we <laughs> it. Damn it, that could have been content. Yeah. Right. You might have given birth to no, Beetlejuice. Really. You don't have to tell your parents. You know what you could do? I didn't want to tell you this, but I took a Polaroid of the toilet. And we can just mail them a picture of that. That from Florida, you know? And they can say it's our That's country. not gonna make a woman smile. Oh, you did? You took a friend. You know that. She just wants to be like all the other yenders who walk around. You know, we could name the baby and everything. Clumpy. Clumpy Stern. Allison would not laugh at this. A little clumpy. Baby. You're bullying your... Uh, so anyway, I, I don't know how any woman involved with this movie said, yeah, that seems much less plausible. It seems like how much I would less... act. Much less the director, who was a woman. I, I, I mean, th this had to be, you know, they did 25 drafts of this script. That had to be one where they go, I don't know how we're going to pull this off. You're just going to start laughing when you hear your husband make fun of your uh, baby who was miscarried? And this is how you and also see Robin as a horrible person, too, because as a woman... And you're friends with Allison, because you were friends with them during this time period, yeah. correct? 
Wouldn't mm-hmm. you care about her feelings at all? Well, well, if you listen back, I do think Robin sort of assumes the voice of reason role and says, oh, Howard, that's terrible to be talking about that stuff. But uh, she was, in fact, Robin is the one who says, I told you it was too early to be talking about this on the radio, meaning let the baby develop more before you start talking about this, because now you've created yeah. a situation that you have to address, which you should right. have done. He was prematurely bragging that he was going to have a kid, and uh, he knew it was going to be a boy. He insists, um, and now he's in the position of having to explain it. I can tell you that, and uh, it was it was an awful experience because the doctor walks out, and there's your kid, your beautiful child, and he's no bigger than the size of an aspirin. How he you? He's not even. So I guess the, the joke is how little this means to him. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, you look at him, and he's in the formaldehyde jar. And I said to my wife, "Buddy." Don't be upset that Howard Jr. We should also point out, everybody, that Betty Thomas initially did not want to direct this because she she didn't want to have anything. She hated him, yeah, essentially. I don't want to talk about it, Robin. I really think you need counseling. I'm going to play a record. DC 101, we've got some great tunes for you this morning. And then Robin will analyze me when we get back from this song. Uh, Very sad music. Not that, Fred. <laughs> play something else. That actually seems like something that would be on the show, what we just heard. Yeah. Yeah. But then not the rock, sh- not the rock song. And thank God Black Hole Sun wasn't released until a decade, <laughs> decades later, because that's what we'd still be hearing right now on the soundtrack. Um, now, the reason now the way that Allison found out in real life was a reporter called her and yeah. said, asked her for comment. And she said on what? And she said on your husband um, joking about your miscarriage. She had no idea that he'd done that. She had to find out from a reporter. Yeah. Second hand. And Howard's response basically is, don't talk to reporters. Are you going out? Too bad. I said when we came here, if I was going to win on the radio. He makes fun of his unborn child and wife. But think about what he does with Beth and these fucking cats. You have to be kidding me. Yeah. Well, he really resented Allison. He, um, I don't think he ever wanted to be in a long-term relationship with her. No. It's 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 more indicative. It's more indicative from that video, the at home movies, where he's kissing her, and it looks like he's kissing his uh, cousin on the cheek or something. Um, and it, you've got the gif somewhere, the the old mm. home movies. Yeah. And it's more plausible. We think that you know he was pressured by Ben and Ray to be married so that he's, they wouldn't. He's said as much. He's yeah. Uh, I I've heard I heard a '90s clip where there was a time in the '90s where he was insufferable. Probably around the making of this movie. We should pause here for a second, too. Probably sure. around the making of this movie. He was insufferable. And both uh, – his his mom could not believe who he'd become and mm. would call in saying, I never thought you would become this. This was whenever he was saying, I go to the strip clubs. A man has to have his own life. I, right. I need my own life. Whatever. That was a big thing of his. A man has to have his own life. Mm. Um, and uh, he says at one point – um, you didn't want me to even marry Allison. She says that he, he says that because Allison and and Ray are such good friends. Yeah. Um, he says that specifically to undermine Allison's confidence and to go, what you didn't? Want... He's causing havoc because uh, uh, because at this point Ray actually likes Allison better than she likes her son. <laughs> Who wins? <laughs> yeah, and he went, he was determined to kick that relationship. Uh, you know. Uh, hang it from a noose and kick the stool off from under it, basically. Um, yeah. So, anyway, he has said on other episodes he never should have gotten into a serious relationship, and he wouldn't have if his parents hadn't, pr- his mother hadn't pressured him. Allison was his first real girlfriend, and the mom immediately was saying, "Get married to her." And uh, uh, I guess Howard, uh, I think, was resentful towards Allison for forcing Peter Pan to be an adult for the rest of his life. And if you go by his own accounting of their life together, he was actually cheating on her when he was at camp as a counselor, um, which, hard, again, doesn't get, yeah, doesn't get addressed. Always, yeah, it's always hard because he claims they were dating when they were 19, yet he was a counselor when he was 20, and he was yep. banging away like crazy when he was 20, so that the, their timelines don't ever – either he was cheating or he's lying about when they actually started going out. Or he's lying about cheating because he wasn't with any women at the time, so which right. is far more likely. That's very likely. Shift in the listening habits. 
one disc jockey has wiped out our entire audience? Not your entire audience. Not no. Can we get him? I've got such good news. It's going to blow your mind. Now here's the 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 dinner where. Howard reveals he's got a brand new job, and Allison reveals I'm pregnant. They both have the greatest news to reveal to one another. Um, that guy's a character actor, right? I've seen him in things. Tons. Seinfeld, probably. Yeah. Uh, so Howard truly did um, uh, kind of the NBC show up on NBC's radar because of the ratings that he was getting in D.C. Mm-hmm. And whenever he met to, with them, you you alluded to this earlier. Uh, the negotiations did not include Robin and Fred. It was no. Howard Stern goes to New York City. Um, I believe that Howard didn't recognize Robin because they were only working together for about sixteen months total. Mm-hmm. Um, at this point in real life, Robin's not working with him anymore because uh, she, Howard accepts the job, does not include her or Fred in the negotiations. Um rewrites history later and says, you know what? They promised me they were going to hire you. Uh, of course, my lawyer didn't get that in writing. Nothing was formal. Um, so anyway, Robin at, uh, at this point stops talking to Howard, wants nothing to do with him, stops showing up to work even. And Actually, uh, if, if, Sorry, one sec, ahead. Ben. If I'm not mistaken, isn't it the situation he gets this offer and then all of a sudden the people she's working for actually explain to her, look, well, we'll give you this much in D.C. We'll give you this much more of a raise, which he's not expecting because she went to Buckwald for advice or the Howard's Buckwald lawyers. Basically. Picture, yeah. but, but, not, Buck, uh, not Buckwald, but Howard's lawyers at the time. Howard, yeah, Howard's – perhaps Howard's lawyer, Howard's lawyer wasn't an entertainment lawyer either, he claims. He was just – I don't know what some kind of lawyer. But yeah. um, they were apparently – uh, so excited about keeping Robin at the very least, they were going to give her a raise that Howard claims in his latest rewrites was more money than Howard was going to get paid in New York, which is unthinkable that right. GC was going to pay Robin more to be the number two to, to uh, the grease man than Howard was going to get paid as the number one guy in New York City. But mm-hmm. anyway, she, um, his, you know, in the rewrites, Robin is so loyal to Howard, she is insulted that they want to, him want her to work with the Grease Man, mm-hmm. and therefore doesn't. That's not the case. She yeah. um, doesn't show up to work for something like three weeks or a month or something like that. Remember, it was five it's weeks. Yeah, five and weeks. then by the time she came back, the they, they're the like, table. "We do love the table, lady." Like, yeah, right. So she then goes, "Fine, I'm out of here. I'm going back to Baltimore." Um, Burns all of her bridges in D.C., including giving an interview where she says Howard's racist, says he yep. cut off her microphone all the time, whatever. She figures that's it. We're never seeing each other again. Um, mm. And Howard does the last, I'm going to say, like two months of his show in D.C. without Robin there. Now, and then, the, unforgivable, and then in, yeah, sorry. the unforgivable thing in this is they make it so that this pig vomit villain fires Robin in New York, thus bringing up right. the team and loyal Howard is determined to get her back. And that's not right. what happened. Howard broke up the team, did not include Robin in negotiations. Robin left uh, in a huff. The only reason, the only terms under which that Howard would work with Robin again, when he did bring her back to New York was if she agreed, it would not be a repeat of the drama they went through together in Detroit where, where, sorry, in D.C., where she was no longer speaking to him, where she was calling uh, Allison in uh, in fury, where the point where Allison is telling her, you need crisis counseling. Crisis counseling, yeah. Yeah. And they and he, she wasn't allowed to bring up the fighting either. Like, we're never going to discuss this. Now, this According part, to... he... so, oh, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. According to Robin, they were actually the only friends she had the whole time yes. she was there. And right. she does not mention a single other friend in that time. And anytime she needs help, she calls Allison. They bail her out. They uh, loaned her money to get her first I mean, deposit or every single way. And she was impossible to work with. She was just insane. And they underplay it here, obviously. And they also underplay every, almost every negative aspect of their relationship. They underplay here because they want to give you the dynamic duo image of, oh, it's Robin and Batman, you know, no, right. no pun intended. Um, and this, so know, this scene, this scene, um, so, so when Howard was hired, 
I think it was Bob Grant. Is that the guy's name? No, no, no. That's yes. a different TJ. That's a TJ. That's a TJ. Uh, I forget the guy's name. When the the, the guy who hired Howard uh, leaves about leaves NBC for some advertising agency, I believe it was about two months after hiring Howard. Mm-hmm. So they've already given Howard a contract. They're committed to having him start in September. And then it was, I believe, NBC, CBS, one of the two, airs this special on Barnyard Radio where the guy says, you've heard the clip, I can't, what I can't control is the sounds coming over this radio in my house. And he's, it's a, the, the thing is, radio is getting so risque nowadays that you mm-hmm. can control people from physically entering your house, showing your kids the wrong things, telling your kids the wrong things, whatever. You can't prevent, and you can not have cable, whatever, but you can't prevent radio from coming into your house if you have a radio. So NBC saw this and goes, that's our guy he's talking about. In this special, he's talking about Howard Stern. And now we're going to have him on our radio station in the, in, in uh, middays. Um, so they wanted to not bring him in because the guy who had hired him was no longer there. So they looked yeah. into what can we get? How can we get out of this? They found it was going to be too expensive to get out of it. So they said, all right, we'll bring him in, but we're going to keep tabs on this guy because we didn't sign on to this. We're stuck with somebody else's hire. That's not what we want. Right. So anyway, in the movie, they see this and they go, everyone's fired. That didn't happen. Mm-hmm. And this, that, that was, yeah, that was the big dramatization. Now this, the Paul Giamatti character, and they've admitted to it themselves, was an uh, amalgamation of a couple characters, wasn't he? They yes. call him Pig Vomit, but there's Pig Virus, Pig Vomit. There's, uh, was it Kevin, Kevin Matheny? Kevin Matheny is the, is the literal man that this character is based on, and he was called mm-hmm. Pig Virus uh, in real mm-hmm. life, and, and um, Howard's band was called Pig Virus in real life. But yeah. he's also, events are based on Kevin Matheny was gone by 84. So Kevin, so Kevin Matheny and Howard only worked together for about two years before Kevin Matheny left to start VH1. So um, they only had a, a couple of years. So by the time Howard's winning at the end, Kevin Matheny had already been at VH1 for like a year and a half. Right. He's, already, um, he's, he's still successful. They make it like he, he was a complete failure and uh, bounced yes. out of the business. Right. Right. And that he's two-faced and that he's a, a weasel. And it's not nothing like that. And Kevin Matheny takes, takes um, part in the history of Howard Stern and says, I hit the dump button maybe six times the entire time we worked get together. And I don't mm-hmm. even recall what it was over. Um, Meanwhile, but, too, like Robin was just asked to read the news stories in a certain credential of time that everybody did. And she couldn't work within the confines of the professionalism of radio. Well, no. NBC was known was, you know, this, this is NBC radio and NBC is important. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's AM radio, but it's NBC. And they had a way of doing it, a format for here's how our right. news reports are coming. Robin was very green in radio. She'd only been working in radio for about two years at this point. And she's yeah. already now at NBC uh, being the uh, news, the, the mid, she would never have gotten hired if not for Howard. They um, and everyone knew it. She's not up to it, but he had to, he wanted to bring her, so they bring her. Um, and yeah, she, she had to go to the local scene. Club. Yeah, WNBC. Well, they, they had they had first of all, she had no experience writing copy, and they were throwing her into a job that she really was not qualified for That's on right. any level. And it was really like they liked the voice that she did have a good radio voice, except for the fact that in her book she mentioned she had to go through some kind of vocal training to get away from the way she was pronouncing the letter S. And I, to this yep. day, I've never heard I've never heard her either it worked or it was made up for the book because I've never heard her misspell misspeak using the letter S in any odd way. She's fucked up a million other words and names, right. but that's right. a, that's a whole other case. So I, the, sto- I, the story I, I, in the book, I'm sorry, so the story in the book was, um, she, she was supposed to fit in four news stories, but she decided once I fit, I just cut it down to three. And that way I was able to make the, the five minute, whatever five minute mark, however she was supposed to hit. And then yeah. Mary Beth, the evil Mary Beth decided, no, 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 we want four and we'll show you how to do it. Red pen through all of her copy. Uh, it probably looked like a murder scene after the after she was finished with the red pen. And then it was Mary Beth, the idiot, 
it was Mary Beth, the evil person, not me, the incompetent one. And it's it's in in a lot of ways. If you filmed <laughs> Robin's book, which you said when we did that podcast, Ben, it would it was almost as if the book was written as if it was going to be made into a movie. The same That's way right. this. This right. with this movie, if translated into a book, would have the same arc. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So here's where I meet my pig virus, my pig vomit. Yeah, yeah. And here's how she almost kills me, and I win. But Sam, you were gonna say it's uh, it's basically like journalism 101, and being surprised is a first year journalist student that you get back from an editor, a copy of something with a bunch of red marks on it. Why would you be surprised that you're not good at this right away when you don't have the experience? Well, you know what? You just, why would you be offended? That's right. And you just touched on that. That's their life. Uh, that's their, their, that's their worldview. And that's what I think that the view of this movie is. The, the movie sort of says, how dare an employer have expectations of an employee? So every employer is considered a bad guy because they have expectations of the person they're paying to do a job. And it right. says, no, no, no. The worker knows best always. Not the person who's paying them to do the job. They have no right to tell them how they should do their job. So mm-hmm. Robin being offended that that her first shot at uh, doing NBC level copywriting wasn't good enough it's not only indicative of the real life howard and robin but the movie basically is people who are bosses don't know what they're talking about that's why he's got serious by the balls and they're gonna keep hiring him I wonder how I wonder how much longer that is going to go for, and I'm certain it's not any ninety million or eighty million or even no, no, fifty no. million dollar contracts. No, look that at his budget. outfit here for a second. By the way, he's yeah, so so he's mixing some genres here, kind of he's <laughs> sort of the heavy punk metal. Rocker. He's yeah, he's he's sort of wearing the look that I described earlier at the Grammys. He's yeah. wearing right now the motorcycle jacket, the big but wig, like a dead head too. <laughs> yeah, he's the, he's he's a lot of different. You know what it is? He's like. Make me look like a guy who likes music, but doesn't yeah. know. Okay, but deadheads aren't motorcycle riding, riding bikers, <laughs> and who who also have Metallica hair. You got yeah. to fit to one. Now, okay, so this is the uh, the interaction with Imus that they're allowing him as if he's a complete arsehole, which apparently he was. He was a, a drunk, and he was actually a cocaine addict at the time, Imus. But he also had incredible ratings. And at he one point, also take Howard to lunch, and was Howard's champion in the company. That's not a movie, obviously. So excited because I am New York's first ever gay disc jockey. Now this is now, only touching a little yeah. on. Uh, we got to talk about this. Yeah. Early days, there was so much gay content. It was yeah. tar- a gay Stoke, Legend of the Gay Apes, and uh, every every almost every bit Hill Street, not Hill Street Jews, but um, what was the other one? Um, God, it was basically take anything in pop culture and put gay in front of it. That the was gay. that was the extent of gay, uh, his writing pop. style. Yeah, right. And, and it's so, because it was yeah. the the um, segment of society that it was perfectly okay to bully. So you were totally allowed to go out and make gay jokes, gay jokes. I mean, he was um, he was declared dangerous by people um, who, who were um, advocates in the gay community because of his position on HIV. He, HIV was so new and so unknown to most people at the time that mm-hmm. they said that Howard was sending out dangerous messages that HIV can be communicated by the um, most touching or kissing by the most everyday gestures, share a toilet mm-hmm. with somebody, you get it. And they said it's dangerous the message that he sends. But um, yeah. there's a clip of it online, and um, yeah, but it was the lowest. This is the acceptable punching bag, gay people. Yep. And it's also something. It's also even- something hugely familiar to him. So. Also, then to come back all these years later and say, I was an advocate. I was introducing gay uh, culture into regular people's lives who didn't really have anything or knew about it. You weren't doing that. You were making it okay to bully gay people. Yes. You were giving gay, ammunition to mock. Every gay he, he introduced us to 
had a gerbil about to fall out of his ass, had well, uh, semen that he was drinking as though it was uh, Gatorade. You know, it's it was not a realistic view whatsoever of a gay person. And in between every uh, TV show appearance, coming on to the male host constantly and uh, uh, tr- attempting to kiss them or get spanked by them and, 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 and leaving the women alone completely. <laughs> Sometimes he would pretend to be so turned on by the women that right. he would uh, go, oh, well, look, show me your legs. Oh, where are you get?" Knowing that they were just going to say, will you buzz off, that kind of thing. But he was expecting them to do that, you know, to say, oh, knock it off. You know that uh, that one show he was on when he got fired from NBC and he was wearing the yellow jacket. The Michelle March was on. She was a newscaster. He was giving an interview and he kept asking where she is because she's got nice legs. That's right. And the guy actually said she would not come on the show knowing he was going to be on the show That's because right. she did not want to be harassed. And the other newswoman on the stage with them said, why do you think you can talk to her like that? Or why do you think it's acceptable to what, talk why to is us acceptable? like that? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Women were just props for him. Yeah. Look at them. They're taking their headphones off all satisfied with themselves. We gave them a great show making fun of these gays, didn't we? That was like working on the chain. The hair's longer. Well, the hair's many, longer. Look how many hey, now here's where Howard destroyed. has invented grunge about yep. 14 years before grunge comes out. <laughs> And isn't he still at this point mustache and big yes. afro? Yes, tucking in his work shirts. He would wear what they called work shirts. Um, uh, you know, had his high waisted jeans, the Ben Stern glasses, the uh, Ray Stern haircut. What's that? Every scene, it's a different wig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Page 108, paragraph 3, no jokes dealing with flatulence, excretion, urination, ejaculation, or other bodily function. Also no paragraph 2, no use of the social... Now, can I... So take out, stealing George Carlin. Yeah. Can I point out something here, too, that just is a real-life concern here? That okay. um, in the movie, Howard's concern always, at all times, is ratings. It's all worth... Anything you do is okay if you're getting ratings. Right. Um... And that's supposed, that's the view you're supposed to take. So you're allowed to do whatever it takes. Show naked women. Um, have guys weigh their stool. Do whatever it takes for ratings. Now, that's a very lowbrow approach where you just go anything for ratings. That's why mm-hmm. he was looked down upon by people because they go, yeah, you got to have some taste. you got to have some standards because otherwise you're um, – you know, you're prostituting yourself, basically. So mm-hmm. at NBC, of all places, it meant even less for radio to have ratings because radio was generated so little revenue for NBC. I read, it's in the Colford book, Ra- radio brought in something like $5 million a year for the company. It was, it was meaningless. It was an and, afterthought. And television brought in $300 million a year. So mm-hmm. the ratings that Howard would bring in and by the way, he's not the morning man. He's the afternoon man. That, that's right. And, and it's, um, not, it's, it's not forgotten. Robin claims in her book that the only reason they went to mornings was because of her. And yes. then she explained, he goes, well, why, do we, why would we want to go to the mornings? You know, we're number one. And she goes, yeah, but we have no competition. Exactly. There was no, <laughs> there, there was no competition. It was, first of all, they're on AM radio. And none of the music that they're playing in the movie is music they actually played. They played like Culture right. Club um, and stuff <laughs> like that. They literally did. <laughs> <laughs> Diane Ross and all that kind of stuff. So uh, they were a very, I mean, that was Howard's kind of music, even though he pretends it isn't. That was his kind of music. Yeah. Uh, but the ratings, just the pursuit of ratings for the sake of ratings, meant very little to them. Which is why they're saying, look, we're better, we're above this. We're better than this. Jackie gave an interview recently with Dr. Drew, and he said that. Really? He Yeah, he went on a podcast or something that Dr. Drew has. I'm not sure. But he said that uh, before uh, he was on the show, Howard was outrageous, then funny. But then when he came on the show, Howard was funny first, then outrageous. I believe so like that. You, yeah, like you said, that. the ratings for just the sake of – being outrageous before Jackie, I could see just throwing shit against the wall that's shocking to stick. And then after yep. Jackie, it became more about the bit. 
the fun. That is a very consistent thing to, you know, after Imus died, I went back and I read a lot of Imus related stuff from the time that he and Howard worked together. Mm -hmm. How, and Imus was a cheerleader of Howard's. Don't believe anything Howard tells you. Don't believe anything Robin and Fred parrot back. Fred hates Imus because someone who works for Imus was rude to Fred in the hallway. So Fred hates Imus. So you right. can't believe anything they say. Go right back to I have, I have a membership to newspapers newspapers dot com. I search. I see the actual paper as it was presented. Mm -hmm. Imus would praise Howard. He said that he's he's exciting and doing great radio. But I misinvented the kind of radio that Howard was now doing. Um, and in fact, for years, a decade after Howard, more than a decade after Howard um, debuted in New York, he was considered an I Miss copycat. And it, this really bothered Howard because um, you, you, can find, you can find interviews of Howard where he says, every DJ in America now is starting to copy my style. They did it to I Miss, and now they're doing it to me. So Howard back then would acknowledge Imus was the trendsetter. Imus would ask women on the phone, are you naked? There's an ad where you can find it on eBay where it's an Imus ad from 1978 or something like that. While Howard's still in college, Imus going, are you naked? That's the ad that they put out. Um, Imus actually lived the life that Howard pretended to live. So did Steve Dahl. Yep. Imus was the drugger, the, the drugger and drinker. But yep. also, uh, and Imus invented this whole Lowbrow, it's easy to do um, this this uh, um, raunchy radio stuff. He invented it, and then he was done with it because he said it was he was no longer planning things out. He was no longer writing bits. He was just being outrageous, just to be outrageous. This was years before Howard joined the station. So mm -hmm. what Howard's doing now is what Imus had already evolved past, and mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, so the advice that Imus gave Howard was. You need to be funny first. It's exactly like what Jack, what you just said that, that um, Jackie said. Uh, and when Imus was sorry, when Howard was fired, Imus was quoted as saying, "I had warned him that you have to be witty first, not shocking." And uh, you know, there were a number of things leading up to Howard being fired, including this whole um, bestiality dial a date that the animal lover. Did on oh show my god! For people into bestiality, because um, there's doing, so many of he us. He was doing any depraved dilate thing you can think of. Anything mm -hmm. that's depraved, we'll do a dilate version of it. Um, he was getting, he was becoming very sick in this time of his life. Yeah, not out it of was his mind, as he claims, but sick. It was a, it was the Boston, it was a basic studies approach to any kind of broadcasting that, led, that shock was the key, shock first and anything else second. And it certainly included wit. Now, this scene here, now we're going to be setting up here is the uh, match, the match game set, yes. uh, scene in the film. And it's notable because in an interview, might have even been at our, the old forum we were at where he explained that uh, Jackie explained that the contracts and the scenes were set in such a way that to give him as little to do with the film as possible, and he was expected to take very little money for his role in the film, and they included him because at this point they felt they couldn't. They had to put him in something. He was cut out of a bit more, but him, the, the, I think just with the Fox pilots, same with the Fox pilots, he and Fred – and Robin, to a certain extent, of course, were expected to be marginalized as little, as much as possible because Howard wanted the focus on him, right. even, right. especially in his own film. There's no way he was going to share that, oh, he helped me with the bits and, uh, he wrote and passed notes to me to make right. me funnier and stuff. And, 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 and um, they, they talk about this in, I believe, in the history of Howard Stern. The reason why Jackie's hired is because Howard would have comedians come in every now and then. Mm -hmm. He wasn't big on comedians. Um, but he would have them come in every now and then because they were great at killing time um, and they were eager to promote. Yep. And Jackie was the first one ever to resist making the joke himself and instead writing it down and sliding it over to Howard. Mm -hmm. Howard had not had that done for him for, by a comedian before and that Jackie ingratiated, ingratiated himself. Um, if he hadn't been so gracious, Howard would have filled the seat with somebody else. And it is so in, uh, it is so out of touch with time to have him looking like a grunge lord right now, 
in the I year. I was just going to say the wigs even longer, if that's possible. He looks like Tom Kiefer from uh, yeah, from uh, Cinderella at this point. The rest of them are still. Jackie looked like that pretty much. That's about right. And Robin looks probably a little better dressed than she would have been in those years. But that's about accurate. He's the one that's so anachronistic. Yes. He should be diving off a stage and crowd surfing. But what did you have for us, Blank Willow? I'm going to a Pearl Jam concert after work. I mean, what is going on? I'm going to go hang from the rafters and then fall into the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Giamatti was a great choice. Yes, he was. And we know none of us knew who he was at this. He was really good. I all hope the he's actors, embarrassed of this now. <laughs> all the all the actors involved, the actual actors in the film, only serve to illustrate how professional they are versus how completely amateur these people are at acting right. as themselves. And he's sort of, you know, I keep saying. He is in this potluck kind of movie. He's sort of acting for a different kind of movie, Paul Giamatti. His character mm-hmm. kind of belongs in a different kind of comedy. It's a little, it's it's weird. I'm not sure if I'm saying it the right way, but the way he's you know exaggerating, exaggerating his eye rolling and all this kind of, it's he's being Don Knotts suddenly in this movie. Yeah. On the radio, I think that's a no-no. What? But I just said pussy. Yeah, she just said pussy. Yes, pussy is okay. I hate Robin's voice in this scene. Yeah. It's awfully dirty. So I can't say big. Well, we know that she and Fred, she and Fred, are maybe the worst ever at doing accents, and Howard's just as bad. Coming out of your mouth, changing their voice, they can't, they can't imitate. They're not, they're not mimics. In any I used sense to of hate when Robin would imitate Jackie. Hate <laughs> it. My my favorite was when Robin oh, would try to she, she would yeah she would affect a Mexican accent but she would actually be speaking in an Indian accent because that's her go to. <laughs> now imagine being offended that your boss didn't like that bit. <laughs> right. right. It's a perfectly good explanation. I'm all ears, Howard. Let's hear it. Uh, and imagine turning this into a free speech thing. Like, oh, now this know. makes you the martyr for free speech, and you're going to, like, be up on the cross with thorns because you can't say cock and balls at yeah, will. Yeah. Right. It's so ridiculous. Keep in mind, folks, for all the FCC yeah, fines he ever got, he never actually paid for anything. It was the parent no, company that had to pay did. for it. Yeah, he and is only the person with the – only the uh, entity with the license has to pay. He doesn't have a license Robin, issued to him by the government. So anyway, this is fiction. Right. NBC complete, complete did fiction. not fire Robin. I'm sorry. They did on her last day, the day Howard got fired. But they didn't separate the team because they were so out of control. They were not separated. The only thing they were separated was when Robin had to go to speech there. And by the way, during this time, Robin was going to uh, uh, psychotherapy, um, having rage blackouts, uh, was Banshee screaming at Howard. um, Yeah, they, Gary talks about this when and Jackie, when she would be running around with a coffee pot screaming, where is my coffee? Yeah, like, we've got audio where she'd be screaming at interns, interns running, diving behind corners to make sure they don't interact with her. The people at Some the giving company her... who would drive her would be in fear for their life. They would be like, no, it's your turn, no, it's your turn. The driver is not Sorry, taking the call. Have to save her she was right. so insane. She would scream at them the whole ride. Right. And as these guys are starting to grow in the ratings, and by the way, when Howard starts to champion his ratings – he likes to do a number to number comparison. So he'll yeah. go if you listen, he'll go, I got a five nine share. Imus has a, a, a you know a four a five three four, whatever. Yeah. But then you yeah. go, You're not talking about numbers, you're talking about percentage here. Imus has a percentage of this audience morning that's li- this big. Morning, morning listeners, you, yeah. Yeah, and you have a percentage of an audience that's this little thing. There's hefty, right. hefty, hefty Imus and wimpy, wimpy, wimpy Howard. And, you know, so you don't have more listeners than him. You just have a bigger percentage of a smaller pond. 
He right. never could understand that and would be offended when you pointed out to him that there's a difference. 79 IQ, and that's why uh, when Jackie, I think it was a famous Jackie clip where he said, we were number one in the market for our purposes, in quotations, because... For our purposes! <laughs> yeah, and, and Gary makes mention of it when what they were talking about the part. contract negotiations. What number one point. for our purposes. And there was a great thread that we should somehow find a, find a way to resurrect it a little bit about where was he number one across the all across in every market, and he certainly wasn't. In Chicago, huge markets, he was not. Minnesota, well, Minneapolis, I think. No. Not that Steve Dahl was number one at that point, but he could never beat Steve Dahl. No. But Sorry, you Sam, would you think were going to say? He, you would think he was number one everywhere when he was syndicated, too, and that's not the case either. Dallas took him off, and he wasn't number one in multiple places. Right, and, and the, reason big why markets usually, too. the reason why he usually gets to stay is because I, Buckwald would arrange these ironclad, long-term albatross contracts you're not getting out of it, so you're stuck with him. Much like the AGT thing, he claims he left. Uh, well, this is another thing, but it's totally off topic. But he claims he was uh, he left on his own accord, but he had signed a multi-year contract, Without and that's question. why the, the first chance they got a chance to get rid of him once the, the ratings were, went into the toilet, they did, and that was the end of it. So this Ross Buckingham guy is a made-up so, character. So this is, yeah, he was supposed to be, Ju was it Judy DeAngelis he was with at this time? And he had and, uh, I, Yes, yeah, and Robin I was going to say, Robin was being yes. essentially replaced. And he did great impressions. Yes, characters. Howard thought she was funny. NBC. I work with your husband, Howard never understands, too, that uh, the reason why you, you emphasize N and WNBC is because their competition was WABC, and they yes. share three out of the four letters are the same. So you emphasize the one letter that is not. Yeah, he's backed up. Isn't he backed up, Ross? <sighs> yes, you know, you might be right about that, Howard. Oh, really? I think I am right. Who are you? You ever do that again? I'll kill you. I need Robin. She's the anchor on the show. That's what's missing. You so I'm going to call your wife... And I'm going to get my way by discussing your bowel movement on no, air? No, no, no. You need to give him more sex because he's backed up is what he's saying. Oh, yeah. okay. So you need to relieve his tension as your as a wife. That's your duty. But the point um, is, is that I'm going to do this horrible thing to my boss and I should get rewarded by you give me back Robin and I won't do this? Yeah, Robin would have prevented me from doing that. She's the voice of reason. Oh what he God. what he actually wants to say is, I need my racism get out of jail card uh, right. back. My, yeah, my I, can't I need my token black, black back. Yeah, I can't I, I can't I can't use my n word material without Robin in the studio. You know how uh, Howard couldn't possibly be homosexual because he's married. He couldn't possibly be racist because he works with a black woman. Absolutely, and that that's the gayest he looks in the film. That little look. That look, which I made a gif of. Yeah, exciting. and I watch sometimes, <laughs> just and get annoyed. Can we watch that again. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let me. It's the, just... it's the checkmate, motherfucker. Look, he gives the yeah. guy. <laughs> you lose. Of my house, starring thing. I didn't do anything. I wouldn't even be doing bits like that if Robin was with me. I never would have even called his wife on the air if I had Make Robin. Give me some reason. I'm what a struggling. child! What you are, Stern. You know what you are. You're the Antichrist. What? Yes, that's what you are. You are the motherfucking Antichrist. <laughs> that's self-satisfied, fruity look on his face. Oh, my God. Is that what he's Just turning the screws, to? too, because the boss doesn't see him giving that look. Only, the, only he sees it. He's such a weasel. I don't know if you know this, but our own... Now he's wearing Cosby shirts. Actually, some theater experience as well, don't you, Ross? When this shirt has no business on a grunge rocker like Howard Stern at this point. Right. It's like it's like he fell into a fabric uh, fabric warehouse and whatever Still stuck right. to him. It it's like his butt bongo fiesta outfit. Like he's suddenly <laughs> a kind of like a calypso guy. <laughs> he's like Mr. Mambo in SCT. But this yeah. more, the fact that these costumes change too so rapidly just shows you he really doesn't have an identity in fashion ever. No. Never has. No. He's always struggled for it. And yeah. why is yeah. he, he's wearing glasses here when he's actually be wearing like sunglasses in the studio constantly. Well, the sunglasses came later. Uh, I believe it was Buckwald who told him, you need to cover those things. Um, oh, yes. 
it down your throat. This oh is my disgusting. God. Uh, is going down. So, okay, this is what I was getting at earlier. Um, I think it was Steve Allen who said Howard's pursuit of ratings is basically you are a carnival geek. You're willing to yeah. bite the chicken off of heads if it'll draw a crowd. And that's what yeah. Howard was. When you were in the theater. Was that in the documentary um, that uh, documentary First heroes? And, sorry, First Amendment, that's the one, yeah. It's a great documentary. It's not... It's, Sorry, let me rephrase that. In terms of a piece of work, it's not great. But the material that's in there to a hater is great. Yeah. Not just his comments, but Cap- Pat Cooper's as well, who says right. he's not a com- he's, he's not, not a, com- a comedian. He's not a comedian. No. I love Pat Cooper. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who the fuck am I going to get? Beats me. No one wants to work with him. Is it Monaco or Monaco? <laughs> That's very know. true to life. He can't That's read. True. Yeah, he wouldn't know. Well, anyway, she's dead. You know, I'm thinking about this. death tributes. That's a signature <laughs> bit. <laughs> Twenty years before he's been the worst eulogies ever given. And it's Especially always the man David Bowie and Prince. No, I care nothing about. It's right, a yeah. radio man. I care nothing about. Let me spend thirty minutes on him. Let's be honest. There were bags under those eyes. That is the most grunge of all his outfits. That one that we just saw, the plaid shirt with the flannel underneath, long sleeves. And remember, everybody, this is filming in 1996. That Even that look is... Had passed. Is, is, it's, yeah, completely. And that, we'll talk about that later The uh, when we get to the end scene with ACDC, because I have a lot to say about that. Now he's doing his John Lennon glasses. Yeah. A hitman to the United States of America to kill pig vomit, finally. Thank you. I love you, God. I'll do whatever you say if you just make that come true. Now, that's sort of um, a – when he started at, at, at the competition um, at WXRK after being fired. <laughs> Can I just rewind that? He looks like early 90s Julia Roberts. Oh, yeah. Let's... <laughs> Sitting on that couch. So, like, when she's right between sleeping with the enemy and flatliners, that's the look. He was going for, and he loves Pretty Woman. Like he, we all know he's a huge Julia Roberts oh, yes. fan. But why don't we just pause that? Look? That flowing hair is so. <laughs> <laughs> My he looks God. like he looks like a wife has just been told she's lost her husband yeah. in a horrific <laughs> oil rig accident. Grief counseling. <laughs> it's sort of like a robe material too. It, his hair looks like a early '90s romance novel, like you know how Fabio was always on the cover of yeah. those like yeah. Har- paperback yeah, Har- books, Harlequin, or yeah, one of those uh, one of those. Yeah, why? I, I don't the, get these choices. The big boss, general manager guy, who they're always referring to here, Poppy from Seinfeld. <laughs> he's always in the same suit, right? This monochromatic look. Yeah, and he's look. He's blending into the background. Yeah, like exactly. This. Looks like he's wearing a doily, and on top of that, this this is this is the funny part. He at this point, if if anybody wants to look online, just just Google private parts Howard Stern Polaroids, and you'll find a oh, bunch yeah. of test right. photos of him in the trailer with Ralph being trying on all these. Um, <laughs> and, 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 talks yeah, about, and mention when I when I say he goes, make me look like a person who likes music. They're like, right. you mean like Chris Cross, those rappers? Okay, how about if I give you some overalls? Or, or Gerardo. I mean, yeah, do right. It's like somebody then, back then, their version of Google, they go, music. Let me look up yeah. music. Here's what they wear. <laughs> The first, the first thing it was, it was like the summit video when um he he wanted to look up what it, was it um we're thinking about you or some phrase and the minute he typed in images the first thing that came up with the words i'm thinking about you came yeah. up he decided the green to room and it's probably, yeah green a, room, you, literally you probably, a green woman with a green probably woman type with a, in chart and that's the first thing that shows up when, right. when he had his 60th birthday show, I was watching old uh, red carpet clips for when him and Beth were walking down. And he's giving an interview and she's giving an interview. And she, he goes, how would you describe his style? And she goes, like a vampire rocker. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? He does look a little interview from with a vampire here. <laughs> I was like, this guy is just I, I always think of someone who's been pulled out of a freezing river and just give him whatever <laughs> clothes they have to get him warm because his body temperature back up. <laughs> Welcome on MTV for the first night ever. Lestat in the coffins. <laughs> Lestat. 
And Vin. He should have a hot coffee in front of him that he's trying to drink from right now. Look at that I wonder nose. If, oh, I wonder if that nose was as hard as he said you could go fishing with the fucking thing. Mm-hmm. But you he, he said uh, that one some of those scenes were reshoots and he had gotten a nose job near the end of the film. Mm-hmm. And um I think right. you, you, probably in some pickup shots you could see the difference, but it was it was substantial the the work he got done on that nose. This part always confuses me. So Robin is a real estate agent now? Because she's she showing wants... an apartment, or is this supposed to, be, <clears throat> it's supposed to be her apartment that she's showing? Uh, let's go back just a tad. Sorry, everybody. I'll get it right to that section there again. And, okay. It's almost like she's doing an open house trying to move. So she's her own agent. <laughs> she's screaming at the prospective buyers. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a very quiet street. You're going to like it. Yeah. She's supposedly doing real estate, but in actual fact, wasn't she with her parents? No, she wasn't fired. Well, so, no, but she, 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 oh, she had that job, the, the one that was going to offer her roughly about 500000 over five years. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Sure, sure it was. You're back. I got you back. It's a miracle of all miracles. I can't talk right now. Seriously, oh, the way his hair is going by the... Your decor, Robin. Look at that. She's got the bust of a Roman gladiator back there. <laughs> She's got that on her door. It looks like uh, seven flight, seven floors she can choose from. Like it's an elevator, even though she's a ground floor apartment. Yeah. yeah. Well, she really it. had gaudy taste. Like I remember that Architectural Digest spread. It was very gaudy. So do you think that was based on her own? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. And this Where long, flo- this long flowing cardigan uh, <gasps> that him and Ralph, I think it was in the contract, he was allowed to keep every single bit of wardrobe that oh. he used in the film. So him and Ralph used that as an, as an excuse to just go wild with all the fashion. So he's got this huge closet full of I movie so. swag. It's like he said, make me look like Whoopi Goldberg from the year 2019, like she would wear. The way his hair keeps getting longer, it's a wonder he didn't just throw it off a balcony at the He's end of the movie. Allison fucking climbed Robin, it. Like, climb, up climb, up these, <laughs> climb up these, climb up these, climb up these extensions. Yeah, yeah. If you anyone wants to look at the contract, it used to be on SmokingGun.com. I think it still is, but you can see first priority given to the makeup and our and hair lady, and uh, it should still be there. <laughs> Gives me great pleasure now to welcome back on our show the very beautiful, multi-talented, uh, vivacious, tight-sweatered, beautifully big-breasted Robin Quivers. I love her. Thank you. May I say that you are beautifully big-breasted Just again? how I want to be introduced. And this is not actually going into the fact that they, according to how uh, Robin in her book, when the, he did, when she... When he said, you've got a chance to work again together, you have to promise me you're going to go do something about your anger issues because we can't have that happen again. Mm-hmm. This, In this case, he's on his hands and knees wanting her to come back because she's so so essential. But, I know she's right. crazy, but wouldn't you be angry working with a racist man who hates women and is constantly doing this shit all day long? I that's funny, but that's not her anger issue. Her anger issue is she wanted more attention, more time on the air. You know what? Let oh, me yeah. tell you something. Pause this for a second. Sure. Why not? That's a perfect place to pause it on. Yeah. Damn. Uh, uh, it's <laughs> sort of a motion blur there going on. Um, okay. When Howard first wow. had a naked woman on his show, <laughs> it was a couple of naked women and it was a naked man as well that came in as a group. And yes. it only happened after he begged and begged and begged and finally punished his audience for not bringing <laughs> the naked woman. So he was just going to, I'm not going to say anything funny. I'm just going to play songs because you wouldn't send me a naked woman. So the naked woman who actually show up, one of them was like a, one of those like singing telegram, stripogram type yeah. women. Yeah. So it was yeah. a person paid to come to it. Yeah. And another one was, uh, I believe it was just a couple, a man and a woman both came. So he allowed the man to get naked in front of him too. So he very nervously gets what he wants, which we, what he was asking for. I'm sure he heard another DJ somewhere else in another city did this. So he decided to do it. So he gets what he wanted, which is this naked woman. He can't naked women. He can't believe his fortune. He can't believe what he's seeing. He can't believe whatever. And he decides I'm going to call my mother. 
oh while I have you here. God. So he tells mom, you will not believe what I have here in front of me, these naked women. And it's very creepy to listen to. Ray goes, I can't believe that you're doing this. Ray considers herself a feminist and thinks that this is deplorable to do this. She said, you wonder why women don't like you? Look how you treat them. How, you yeah. know, they're, they're, she says, why are you carrying on like this about the human body? She says, the, I was outside with the neighbors and we were, we were listening to this. So yeah. they found it embarrassing and degrading and humiliating. Um, Robin describes him later as being like a little old man in a peep booth when he would bring these women in. But uh, he has them in the movie. Oh, they're so willing. They want to give me massages, this and that. He browbeat his audience into sending him a woman. Um, and he calls his mom and wants his mom to know, I'm looking at naked women right now. Does it, beyond being gratuitous, this scene, it doesn't it also come across as trying way too hard to appear as if he loves women? Loves them in a sexual way? Yeah. Like, I'm really horned up and sexed up, and let's get not just a naked woman, but some naked, like, some porn star with the biggest possible fake tits in the, in the, on the, wor- in the right, world. Right, right. And, and blonde. It has to be blonde, of course. Yeah. Because that's, that's his shiksa dream. Yeah. And bear in mind that this version, according to the movie, this version of Howard's life story is what he's sharing to the passenger sitting next to him who hates him because he's Howard Stern. So he's telling him, you know what? You're not going to hate me after you hear my life story. This is the, the life story he tells. Oh, yeah, I brought in this naked woman. I had her all over me. I was massaging her, rubbing my hands all over her. Uh, my wife. Uh, just keep going, guys. I've got to do a little something, and uh, I'm just gonna. I'll be right back. Sure. I know you can hear me. So uh, Allison did not like that he would do this stuff. Oh, she also, and who would surprise? Right. It's embarrassing. It's, right. So what we're seeing again is the the guy who's willing to bite the head off of a chicken in order to draw a crowd. That's what he's doing right now. Is. Uh, describing to all the guys, you won't believe the naked women I'm looking at right now. And this whole, I'm going to have her massage me and stuff. Now, most women don't want their husband to go at, at their job, have a naked woman massage them. No, but and there's no gets away with it. Because, yeah, right. It, it doesn't gets away do anything. Says, well, Howard's, always, Howard's thing is, it's not cheating, because I say it's not cheating. Um, that's always been his his yeah. reasoning. And the whole it's not cheating thing doesn't make it so you made your marriage nice. You didn't do one thing, supposedly, so that makes you a good husband. But everything else you didn't do. Are you – you know most, what I mean? You didn't watch the kids. You didn't care about her career. You didn't care how it made her feel. You hated celebrating parties. You didn't want to throw her a birthday. You didn't want to make a speech. You did as little as possible, but you just didn't cheat under your terms so you're a yes. good husband. Although most people would consider going and having cyber sex with strangers cheating and going and having these women massage you and all this other stuff cheating. Most people would consider that cheating. He says it's not cheating because it's for ratings. Right. Where, where, that, where that works. <laughs> cyber sex wasn't for ratings, but uh, he got away with that. You know why I love you? You're smart. You know what? I think it's time to play a bird tonight. Now, so anyway, in the this studio, is... would there be phones like that? So like never been there's there. a... Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's a direct emergency line that says cut to records there might have been i don't know it's Um, it's entirely possible because but uh, it sounds like it would be a little too jarring and too distracting for someone who's actually doing the recording to just suddenly cut away and call and talk to someone about it can i also say this version of women like this huge implants small waist no butt really bleach blonde hair I am so glad that this isn't the staple anymore for like what's attractive because yeah. it's just, I mean, it's fine, but it's so defined what that period was. Not the period that depicted in the movie, but the period right. was, no. when the movie was filmed. Correct. Well, that, well that's, but, it, but even, but it, that's the whole, that's, that's another thing that's a little anachronistic about this. Not the fact, just the fact that if this is mid eighties, implants were not 
Right. They were not the norm and certainly not that look. He was going for a Pam Anderson, Jenny McCarthy look at the time because that was what was hot. But it doesn't belong here. Well, that's that's where the movie as a movie sort of like ties its own shoelaces and trips as it walks. Because you could present Howard to the women. You know, you're trying to sell him to the women. Did you have to make it a porn star? Could you have just made it a regular woman and said, look how beautiful a regular woman is? No, it has sure. to be a porn star. In fact, the woman sitting next to him that he's trying to impress and say, like me, does it have to be super mo- a supermodel? Could it just be mm-hmm. a regular mom? No, no, yeah. no. It's got to be a supermodel he's attracted to. Um, so he's going to give the best, paint himself the best light. If it was a normal mom, he wouldn't be caught dead talking to her. So it's the movie gets in its own way. Yeah. You, you know what I'm surprised about, too, is I watched the Siskel and Ebert uh, review of this, and it was surprisingly good. Mm-hmm. Why, why was this given um, positivity, or, like, why was this considered even it, well-reviewed? Because it, it had the lowest expectations. Sorry, go ahead, Jim. I think I think number one they didn't they were not fans and they never listened to his show so they were they were reviewing it as a movie as a piece of theater cinema and so what they ended up doing was saying well look it was put together professionally and it had a beginning a middle and an end and that's what the, those guys with them it's like math these films does it have a story does it have a, a protagonist is he likable they try to make him as likable as he ever was in this film like this naughty little guy that's fighting the system whatever very lenny bruce-ish you know kind of thing a sympathetic martyr they reviewed it like that oh and this is the other thing hold on let me just pause uh, this when it gets don't you? yep and so this is okay first of all so the reviews when they came in it was all about we didn't expect that we were going to actually like that we'd like this guy and every real fan knew that this film was fiction once they started watching it, which is why it never did any kind of box office they were hoping for, because they knew it was horseshit. And he, the other the fact was he shilled it for a full year and the amount of swag and promotion and interviews and then interviews three weeks into it when it's tanking, two weeks into it when it's tanking and he's going on this press junket, people can smell they can smell shit. They don't yeah. need to see it to know it's around. And so that's why those a lot of those reviewers who should have known better, but they don't know and didn't know because they weren't fans. People who are now reviewers were fans, and they can tell you, and some of them are a little more like that Maureen, what's her name, Maureen, um, the, Maureen Callahan, the uh-huh. one that did the article recently about um, why is he getting a free pass for post. Yep, absolutely, and I'd love to interview her. Yeah, she yeah, um, she nailed she nailed him so completely that um, I wish that would have happened more often back in the day, and it rarely did. Only that one interview that I I gave you guys the link, and when another show when we finish this, I'll give you guys the the full rundown of it, and uh, when we tackle the post post private parts blitz, and it's uh, perfect. It's the perfect review. If whether you're a hater or not, it's it's if you're a fan, that's the review, the only one you should really read. This so. movie, I think, better than any movie I can think of, articulates the phrase "you can't be everything to everyone," and that's what mm-hmm. this movie is trying to be. It's trying to be a Hallmark movie with shaved vagina right there. <laughs> and you can't be both of those things. No. And so the the other the other thing is at, the, at this point he's right he's got an uh, anti NBC shirt which he did not ever do. This was Harvey Pekar who actually did this on the Letterman show, and uh, he also no, didn't he look did. like this. Check check him out on Arsenio. On Arsenio, but, he wears the anti NBC. But not but not on Letterman. Not on Letterman. No, no, not while working for NBC. Exactly. <laughs> he was not the rebel he claims to be here. You got to see him on when he he's on. He never was. No, but you got to see him on Letterman at the time that that's the Howard wearing the black leather pants and cowboy boots because he was copying Imus. Mm-hmm. Um, Howard actually wore cowboy boots. I know. I've seen Well, they kind of have him doing it there, except the po- cowboy boots are brown. <laughs> what is with his Steve Harvey blazers that go down to his waist i mean it, sorry down to his knees That's, he looks like so beetle like like the movie beetlejuice like that jacket beetlejuice wears throughout the movie like what is that purple blazer i i really hate the costume design and look of this movie 
It it I don't like the lighting of it. I yeah. I really think that it just looks it's a bad example of the nineties. It's a perfect example of bad nineties. I also just it's do you think that these meetings took place like in this way that's so unbelievable? No, they didn't. What they've so what would have happened now at this point is Howard has gotten Don Imus, I'm sorry, Don Imus, but Don Buckwald as his agent yep. to go in and he had Randy Bongarden at this point, who uh, was the general manager, who loved Howard. Um, yeah, championed and, him. Yes, championed him and said, tore up his contract and said, you do deserve more. We're going to give you another two years at this rate. Buckwald negotiated that for him. Um, when Howard did become when I say number one, it's sort of like what you said, number one for our purposes. It's number one among men, 18 to 54. It's not number one. It's number five overall. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't, it didn't even get, I'm sorry. It's, I think it's like number five on AM, yeah. let alone FM. Um, right. But anyway, in any case, uh, when, when they get that, they become insufferable at um, NBC. And when you listen to the Howard Stern, the, the uh, history of Howard Stern, you wonder how people put up with them because Howard and Robin basically wanted everyone to kiss their feet out in the halls. Um, because to them, ratings were everything, but they're working for a company where ratings didn't matter that much. No, and like absolutely. you said, it's the radio division. Yes. At a time when Carson, and we did this in the Carson podcast, yeah. he was responsible for almost 20% of NBC's profits. NBC's yeah. total That's, profits. I mean, Howard might have Maybe he was getting a million people a week listening to him. I mm-hmm. love that Carson never had him on, and he knew he was a yeah. carnival <laughs> barking idiot. Yeah, uh, and, he might have had a million listeners, but Bill Cosby had twenty five million um, on the Cosby yeah. show. On the so, Cosby show, absolutely. So it's you can't compare. I mean, um, um, that's something that Howard and Robin had never understood that the ratings that you were able to draw, which were fine. Um, meant very little to the company. Overall, into the bottom line, absolutely not. Right. right. And in his small mind, he still thinks ratings is the most important thing because when he talks about podcasting and the success of it, he can't compute podcast success in his measly brain because he still thinks of ratings as a success, the only indication of it. Right, right. So this obviously never happens. The guy, the boss, traitor, two face, never comes groveling. I know I've been a real pain in the butt, okay, but that's all over with now. This is pure fantasy. Mm-hmm. I want my boss to come and grovel and admit to me bosses should never have expectations of employees. And when did Howard ever? When, when did when did yeah. Howard ever have the balls to say "fuck you" personally to everybody, anybody in person? It was always on tape. Now here's the yeah. Now here's okay, the, now, here's this is the, the Bryant Park scene. Never happened. You do <laughs> and not the, get ACDC to fly 22 hours from Australia because right. your AM radio show in the afternoon is number one among 18 to 54 year old <laughs> men and number five overall. All right. Doesn't I, happen. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use my mouse and I'm gonna point this out to people who may not be able to see because it all depends on how the conversion works. When you when you film these things, when you do like a, a filming the video, no matter what quality it is, you, there's a bit of degradation. Betty Thomas, when talking on the Howard history of Howard Stern, explains that ACDC did come up. Of course, this was held in Bryant Park. I don't know where that is, but I know it's in New York. And um, they had about 3,500 people. They needed they needed it to look like 5,000 people or so. So they actually had to digitally add people. And all these blurred wow. people you see here at the bottom, those are all additions. Because oh, wow. they weren't paying they weren't paying them very much, so they needed they needed to add because this was early CGI. Like if you look at Braveheart, which was released a couple of years earlier, there was a lot of digitally added army scenes to make them look much more vast than they mm-hmm. actually were. So they couldn't actually get in you know in his hometown. He could not get fans to stay uh, for for 
a full four hours of basically right. lip syncing of ACDC. Right. And what bothers me most about this fucking scene is that, number one, in 1985, ACDC were in the nadir of their career. They were not really happening at that point. Their, their, their next resurgence would have been five years later. So it's not like, first of all, they were not, there were concerts held by radio stations that were like in the West Coast, like uh, there were festivals held constantly. There were, you know, the K-Rock, Weenie Roast and stuff like that. But they would get bands. It wasn't to celebrate some fucking hack j- disc jockeys. Yeah. You know, and they would certainly up- not go to a station like WNBC. Right. This should have been Elder Barge out here playing, not <laughs> yeah, ACDC. yeah, or Peter Frampton. Well, after his 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 big you know fall from that pop- that um that old website I found that old forum. He actually was an extra in this scene, so he writes about oh what it was like. Uh, if you want me to, can I read it? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Can you pause that? Yep. Uh, it's there's there, par- there's him preparing to invade Normandy. <laughs> <laughs> What's with the Louis V talks? <laughs> Louis the Fourteenth. Like, He's got it's it's amazing. Like he, it was almost as if he went through every single best album of nineteen eighty one, eighty two. Yeah, he's a new romantic. So this, right now he's Prince. Is, yeah, right now he's Adamant mm-hmm. <laughs> and or it's, Prince. The, head, the people know so little about music that they just go, I don't know when this happened. I don't know what genre it is. I, I dropped my nerves. So, anyway, uh, go ahead, go ahead, this, Sam. I'll, I'll be right back. Okay, so Private Parts filming continues. A glimpse into what it's like being an extra on Private Parts um, by the king of all medical students, B. Jan. <laughs> I arrived at Bryant Park at 11. Fans were lined up around the block waiting to enter the extra holding area. After waiting and filling out forms and eating lunch, we were called to set at 2 p.m. There was a huge stage with a Howard Stern banner hanging. The entire park was closed for filming. The scene, Howard's triumphant rally when he became number one in New York City radio after WNBC fired him. ACDC, they were actually there, and even jammed with Howard between some takes, came out and played Shook Me All Night Long. As Howard, Gary, Jackie, Robin, Fred, and Allison, Ben, and Ray watched, everyone looked happy. Then the pregnant Allison's water breaks, and uh, and she and Howard run off the stage into a police car on their way to the hospital. The entire cast of characters was there as VIP extras. Jenks, Melrose, Crackhead Bob, Dave Peel, David Peel, Nicole Basque, uh, parentheses, scary. <laughs> King wow, of all... people make it into, the sh- into this. I know, right? Um, uh, okay, it was Betty Thomas's birthday too today, so Fred led everyone in a stirring rendition of Happy Birthday Between Takes. ACDC jammed with Howard. They played the Jack as well as bits of a few other songs. Entertainment Tonight, MTV's, Chris Connolly's, and E and Extras were all there to capture every moment. Gary gave away great prizes to people between takes. We begged for Joke Man to tell some jokes. He finally told one about the kid asking his dad what a vagina looks like as chance of F Timmy's skull, F blaze, and give Gary some hay went up. The mood was light and fun. Howard signed tons of autographs. Girls were asked to flash their breasts to the cameras. Jesus, what a day. I was able to take 27 pictures of the whole thing on disposable camera. Those pictures will be posted on a website to be named later in the next two to three days. It was a long day of filming, but it was well worth it. I was up in the very front, shook Howard's hand and talked to Fred. It was awesome. Girls so, were so. asked <clears throat> to take <laughs> off their tops. Girls who were just there to be extras, unpaid, yes. I'm sure. Yes, he wasn't paid. Well, yeah. there were there were there were only according to Betty Thomas, they were only able to pay so much for a certain amount of people because you. I mean, this is a group shot as extras. I don't even know that they would have paid them more than five bucks an hour and they could only get them for so many hours anyway. So I'm sure the budget was people staying past a certain point where it not getting paid anymore. So it literally might have been 10 bucks a person to sit around this fucking park and watch them, watch him prance around like some, as, 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 as Sam says, some flaming gay lord. Uh, Can you of, imagine in, if he had to film this now, how afraid he would be? He would never film this now. No, 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 no. there would they, so much of it would have to be redone, changed. I, he wouldn't have done the gay characters anymore. Although it would be gay guys out in the crowd flashing their penises right now. And, <laughs> and bending over, showing their whole assholes. Exactly. <laughs> 
And so this is the other thing that bothered me. It's anachronistic because in 1997, also ACDC was not, they were just past their sort of third wave. So they weren't really hot in 97. They were still, you know, up there, I suppose. And doing the hackiest fucking metals, the hackiest rock song of all time as your closer. Well, I, I, I just, it's disproportionate. This audience would be for an AM radio station going number one. I mean, this doesn't make and any uh, sense. By the way, Imus blows. Imus was on your team at the time. But by the way, ratings are fleeting. So you might be number one, and then four months later, you're not number one. Right. I mean, it's it's not, on a quarterly it's basis. Like say, it's not like you finished. It's just this is for the time. It's like okay, you finally got it. Now, if, if they sh- but they w- didn't notice they didn't want to show the Debella funeral because that makes him to be less sympathetic, well, and certainly don't want to talk about Annette Debella, right. who right. freaking killed herself after doing right. a, a a date with uh, Captain Janks. That's right. a whole other saga. I hope we get that one through. I'm waiting for Apollonia to come out with that friggin' tuxedo he's wearing. What is going? on? Hate his clothes in this. Oh, yeah. The date that they give is two months before Howard gets fired from NBC. Push, push. No, no, don't push. Just breathe deep. Don't push, honey. Ice ships. Fuck ice ships now! Really? Ah. Me. We named her Emily. Seven pounds, eight ounces. She was incredibly. Yeah, good. he's got his daughter's weight memorized. <laughs> yeah, I had everything I ever wanted. She could have lost, lost a couple. I'm really not a very good. <laughs> Do you think he had a laser pointer in the delivery room? Yeah, exactly. I Seven wonder what it pounds. would have been like. This, I, she'd be five pounds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I get that all the time. I wonder what it would have been like if he did have a boy, though. Imagine how messed up oh, that would be. I know. Um, Aren't the three daughters <laughs> messed up enough? What a good husband. No, no passenger should be sitting that close to the person next to them. The only thing that's missing, I'd like to Photoshop a bank of computer monitors between him and her and uh, space it <laughs> about 10 feet. Right. This, by the way, is his bad head. side. That he, You can yeah. see it's totally covered with hair. You can see the abyss of his uh, nostril. I know I can get it. Now, this is the fourth wall breaking where he just looks right at the camera. Right. What would it be like to have sex with her? It would be amazing. Straight out of Jack but and Amy Hall. You know why? Uh, I mean, it's... it's, it's um, Manhattan with Woody Allen. No, no, Annie Hall. Is that what you said? Annie, Annie Hall. Annie Hall. Yeah, yeah but Annie. Jack Benny, Jack Benny, way back when, who yes. really, really made it it's, a, this, a it's staple. The movie of tries the show. to be Annie Hall. Yeah. This makes you a good guy. You know what? I'm not going to have sex with her after all. Right. <laughs> I'll just wait until hey, after the scene's done. And then Ralph. when this and this song of all, if you were to say, Google Music. ACDC and Blind Melon. <laughs> they don't have any... They have nothing to do with each other. It shouldn't be on the same playlist. You know what it is? It was whatever was going through his noggin at the time of filming. It's that and Bumblebee so this, video. Yes. Yeah. Then this, this song was so done by the time 1977 came around. Aren't you surprised the Spin Doctors weren't on the soundtrack as well? Yeah. And well every they other did, early they did 90s. the theme song for Miss America, the book. Most did they? The things I do are yeah. Uh, they just made it. They just did a song called oh, Miss a... America 2. Geniuses, is it not? But my life isn't bad at all. Yeah. He I'm... never walked through an airport with his children carrying luggage and helping. <laughs> no. And who knows? With a little time, the right energy, I think I could talk her into some hot lesbo action. Why not just... Why not just... Uh... Okay. So... Finally, let, so so now before we uh, tie it all up, because just credits now. Um, so Stuttering John being in the end is just a throw in, obviously, no different than the Baba Booey stuff. But more actually, I, ironically enough, he's in it more than Jackie. And Jackie's, you know, um, I, I'm sure that must have stuck in Jackie's craw as well. But the film was a complete bomb. It was a disaster. Uh, let's talk a little bit about and that. And in the theater, we were ready to go by the time this guy pops on the screen. It was just like he has uh, such a punchable face. <laughs> we were ready to go. Like let let, let us go. Yeah. Uh, oh, I forgot. There's more. There's a little bit more of um, 
Paul Giamatti's character, I think, there's somewhere in that, here. There's more yeah. of him winning the award. Yeah. So twenty-eight million, and we know they must have spent shitloads of money on marketing that they just won't talk about. And again, in the history of Howard Stern, you'll hear Ivan Reitman talk all about how um, they expected it to do. Even um, the movie producer, the movie, the head of the studio said this is a hundred. I think it was Sherry Lansing said it was going to be a hundred million dollar movie. And I don't know where they thought they that. were going to make a hundred. Sorry to cut you up. Production yeah. consultant Ralph Sorella. <laughs> Ralph Sorella. <laughs> Production consultant. Wow. Oh, there's Eli Roth, set production yeah. assistants. Security for Howard Ronnie Mund. <laughs> Everybody got a little credit there. Ralph somewhere. has never yeah, styled Ronnie. anyone else, correct? Right. There's this, uh, in that blog that I was reading, that old blog, that uh, old one in four four ninety seven, it says the movie has no legs in theaters. Looks like the hype didn't help too much. Granted, Howard's private parts did break just about uh, the thirty million dollar mark. It was no match for its competition, which quickly engulfed moviegoers' money. Last week, it only pulled in two point one million. However, despite the fact that private parts theater legs were broken by its competition. No matter how the hype is generated, there will still be those who refuse to give their money to Stern. Okay, the, as far as the hype goes, when you were talking about the review earlier, mm-hmm. um, and then, you know, you talk about Cisco Lindbergh specifically, their review is thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up means go see it. Would anyone who saw it tell their, their Stern show uh, f- a fan friend, go see this movie? No, nobody no. who actually liked him would have told their friends, go see this movie. Um, whenever I went for my second time, I thought, I don't know, a month or two had passed. As I said, I went to a dollar theater with a friend who hadn't seen it. I thought, you know what? I've enjoyed movies better the second time when I was initially disappointed. Maybe I'll like this. And I didn't. So uh, I can't imagine um, that that the critics and the people, I don't know if it's on Rotten Tomatoes, but I can't imagine that they're that they're synced up. The critics probably liked it more than the people did. Absolutely, and so that was part of the the whole the whole gig. The Ivan Reitman was saying, "Okay, it tested so well. That's just a trick you're using to play to the the masses, saying, look, it tested so well.' At that point, you're throwing whatever you can." at the wall to say, look, go see it. It's a, going to be a great film, blah, blah, blah. And it's just marketing bullshit to try to lure suckers out of, out of their money. Mm-hmm. And this, when I, I only paused it because when you look at all the uh, credits here, it looks like uh, um, Beth's IMDb. Uh, That's listing. right. That's right. <laughs> Her CV. So there's quite a few names here, uh, quite a few names here, like um, uh, Edie, uh, Edie Falco was in it, I believe, at some, at somewhere she's listed. Maybe I missed it. Uh, there were a lot of, you know, character actors laced all through this thing. So um, they definitely wanted to surround them with talented people. It's just so unfortunate that they actually used, they didn't go with Jeff Goldblum or they didn't go with, I don't know, Take a black, like I don't know, Ellen Cleghorn as as Robin or something. No, do you think it would have been better received if they would have allowed other people to play them? No, uh, uh, even worse. Even here's, even worse. Here's, here's how I think it could have been better received if Howard had nothing to do with the script, and potentially if other people had played him, because then you might see a story that was real. Mm-hmm. Here's the problem with any time you have a biopic of a living person. They're going to be a hero. They're going to, it's going to be a heroic look at their lives. Um, mm. you know, you're, you're, you know, you're getting the, uh, approved version of, you know, they're getting the selfie, Instagram selfie version of their life, which is the best of everything. They're not going to allow, um, the true version of themselves to be shown. Right. So giving somebody like Howard, who is a liar to begin with and, um, um, egocentric to begin with and so on. Giving him final say on this, of course, it's not going to be good. Yeah. And the ultimate thing is when a film goes through that many rewrites, which is part of the creative process, I understand it. If it's going through that many rewrites, as he says, or if even half as many as he as he said it was, that means it was heavily problematic to begin with. And uh, they never really solved it. And in the end, 
what you've got like is this pastiche of stuff and it doesn't really work on any level. Is it a comedy? Is it a drama? Is it a romantic comedy? Is it supposed to be gross out humor? It's none of those things. So by trying to appeal to every single market, it's like anything else. They diluted every single aspect of it that would have got some crowd. If they wanted to make it a horror film, they would have, they should have gone, well, they should have just focused on his hair. But if they decided they wanted to go rom-com, they didn't go far enough in any direction. That's why it didn't please anybody. That's what yeah. a compromise is. Yeah, that's right. So. And <clears throat> it's, um, you know, that the video, the MTV thing where Howard's going around showing people his movie or watching, mm-hmm. showing scenes, going, you're going to love it. The huckster that he is, is, uh, uh, oh, you like TNA? This movie has TNA. Oh, you like yep. romance? It has romance. You like yep. rock and roll music? This has rock and roll music. Um, but it satisfies none of them. None of them. I mean, it just gives you a little sampling of it, but it's not authentic. Mm-hmm. Um, not satisfying. It doesn't commit and it, to any identity, just like Howard himself. I, yeah. and I think... I think... I don't know if you guys addressed it while I took a little break there. Um, it was... Uh, such a turnoff to the fans that he overhyped it for so long and for the end product to be so mediocre, I think they were just burned as they'd already been burned with Miss America. So that's this is the kind of arc where he's now selling way too much of himself and for very little – like re- giving re- very little back in return for these high-priced items. And like movie tickets, it's not just a movie ticket. It's going to the theater. It's getting the popcorn, getting whatever, and then having to listen to his horse shit for five hours a day about the film. I can't imagine any – I think a lot of people stayed away out of spite. Right, now, Sam? With, with private parts, he, the way he promoted Miss America with all the drag and everything right after private parts – did any of you, like as fans, or um, think that this was weird? Like, why is he all of a the, the sudden dra- the drag the stuff? Drag, yeah, what what is up with that? Because now, he, so he promoted himself as this loving husband and this love story, and he made this movie of his life, and now the Miss America book in the drag. I don't understand where that thread and how <clears throat> nobody even thought that was the most bizarre thing ever. Well, here's the thing. He did the drag first for Miss America, and he admits that when Jay Leno comes in studio that he called David Letterman, and David Letterman said, Howard, don't come on my show in drag. He goes, you'll, you'll come out in drag, it'll get a laugh for two seconds, and then it'll it'll be dead in it. Like, it, that's that's all it's good for. It. So even He's experienced he that before when he did blackface. Absolutely. So there's no, there's no, after the initial whatever one second of a laugh is gone it doesn't sustain for a full appearance he seems to mm-hmm. think well if i look like some kind of freaky tranny then that that's that's funny enough so that to do it again for promoting this film is just insane i, I Although, just no i don't it, think he did it for this film. no 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 i'm, I'm didn't saying... he do it for this as well at one point that would have been strange yeah no okay. drag yeah no i'm drag. saying don't you think it's strange that he went from this family movie or supposedly, you know, great family guy, great husband, and now I'm promoting this book, Miss America, and I'm well, a drag the queen. Book, Miss America came out before the. This movie was before violence. the movie. So yeah, remember, uh, Miss, Miss, Amer- Miss America is ninety five. This is ninety seven. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the guy had a. <laughs> Mind you, he did dress in drag decade. many times later. <laughs> yeah. 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 So many, it's not. It's, it's, it's not. dressed in drag many times before as well. Right. Yeah. Um, this yeah. Channel Nine show, he was looking for oh, reasons yeah. to put on press. Yeah, remember but, the um, Madonna justify what justify yeah. my love? He was mocking that he dressed up as Madonna, and then he and was that like Helen Stern was one of his characters. He had characters. an interview wig yep. that when he was yep. that. Yeah, so yeah. nobody finds it strange though. Like all of you his know, fans are just it, like on board. This hyper heterosexual male is just constantly finding every opportunity to be in drag. Yeah, yeah, uh, that. That uh, is harder as you are further away from it to go, how was that okay? <laughs> Why were people okay with that? Um, That's what I'm saying. I, 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 I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. Bob. I was going to say, I don't remember exactly my re- I I remember buying Miss America in the store when it came out. I don't remember what my reaction was to all the drag stuff. I remember them talking about, you're not going to believe when you see this cover. You're not going to believe what. Um, I don't think I really thought about it that much. I, I know that I always found men in drag unfunny, except for kids in the hall. But everybody else I always thought was unfunny when they did drag. 
Well, I mean, it was old when Flip Wilson and Milton Berle did it in the you know the fifties and sixties and seventies. Yeah. So for so it's kind of it was completely half baked by the time it was completely cooked by the time um, he started doing it or continued to do it, and it was just the the, the lamest sort of joke in in that era. And didn't forget about two thousand twenty in nineteen ninety. It was yeah. tired. Well, so I, I, think, um, I, it, I think I I think I think that in I'm sorry to cut you off. In I no. think in the in, inherently, it was all about when people people gave him a pass because they liked the other stuff, and this was just sort of okay. This comes with the dinner. I guess we gotta you know put up with him in drag. But I can't gar- I can guarantee not a single fan said. Wow, this is going to be great. He's going to come out and drag, and you know, took the build up and say, "Wow, can you look at this picture?" It, it wasn't like you're. Lo- it's not like you're looking at a Mister Muggs book and and it, marveling at the uh, the drag queens in the book of Scott Salem yeah. looking like some some. As a, jurist- as a Howard Stern fan in the '90s, you did a lot of. Yeah, I don't like that part either. But you did do yeah. that because there was a lot of defending him, and that's oh, why yeah. um, a guy like me who um, has become. Such I have got, I get more joy out of hating his show now and exposing him than I did yeah. as a fan because I was tricked and because I defended him so much. And yeah. you do that, you if you're a person of integrity, you go, I got to expose this con man. Um, and you know, you for us, it's you know, it's, we enjoy. I, it. I, yeah, because as you were exposing the lies when we were going through this, I felt. Sick, like sick hearing it because I know some of them, but then the more and more it piles on, it's just disgusting. And you're looking at this image of him during this. I'm like, it's terrible. And imagine being him and watching this and going, I stole that. I stole that. I stole that. But he's going in the end. This is the truth now. My movie is the truth now for the rest of history. And notice yep. he projects on everybody else. They're stealing my bits. They're ripping me off constantly. It's, a, it's the perfect defense. And as long as your fans are telling you, okay, yeah, yeah, he invented it. He invented it. They accepted everything as a matter of course. So, and unfortunately, he was dealing, as Ben said previously, he was dealing with people who were way more polite than to actually bring it up back to him and say, no, no, you get into a flaming war. No, you did it. You did it. Right. You ripped me well, off. What are you talking I'll tell you, about? I'll, Here's the yes. proof. And I'll tell you another thing, too. Howard, you know, we talk about that. Howard could not exist if, if, if his career had started in the 2000s versus in the 80s no because way. of the internet. And so when Howard had the great advantage over every disc jockey in the country, which was he had access to the to the world's media, basically, New York. Mm-hmm. It's the, mm-hmm. I mean, it's the uh, certainly America's capital of media, and it is in some ways the world's capital. And he yeah. had it in his backyard. So he could tell these people who have, Never heard Chicago radio. I invented all this, and there's a man in Chicago ripping me off. This was something he would go into, and I don't want to go down Steve Dahl route too much. But in a way, this is Steve Dahl's life story. In a way, this is Grease Man's life story. In a way, it's Imus's life story. Um, but to everyone who's just a casual viewer, this is Howard Stern's life story. Um, and you know, one thing I wanted to say when I said earlier about the confusion people have that. Howard has now beaten Imus in the ratings and is celebrating. And you see the crowd that says Imus sucks. He was not up against Imus. They, they're they kind of confusing victories. They're confusing like the Imus funeral, which was yep. an impromptu kind of thing, yep. where he literally was competing against them. And they're confusing. But that's because this movie is so badly set up and made clear to you where it's going. That mm-hmm. you walked away going, uh, you know, it's funny kind of reading reviews that came out at the time going, that's not exactly what happens in this movie. You've kind yeah. of filled in blanks that the movie doesn't left wide open because they didn't do your job. Yeah. And so for, for many reasons, aside from the um, glaring false uh, claims of the movie, the movie itself as a product that – when I first saw it, I had no idea anything in here was wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, I did never, I never liked the movie as a product. Mm-hmm. Even as but a neutral now, film, even as a neutral film goer, you say the film doesn't really work. 
They're just that's common. What I, that's what I said because it uses every cheat there is, filling in every hole by just saying, "Ah, we'll just have the person tell you what's going on here." Yep, color by um, number filmmaking. Yeah, it's not really scenes. It's just a greatest hits. Here's my yeah. greatest hit from when I was there. Here's my greatest hit from when I was there. Yeah. Um, so you're not really okay. You're getting a glimpse of Howard's day job, which is uh, I go on the air and I uh, pretend to be gay, or I go on the air and I pretend to be a black helicopter reporter. But it's not. That's not really a story. That's no. just here's what my day job is. But the right. true reason that you can't tell the story is because he stole his story. He stole his identity. Now, so a real Howard Stern movie could be fascinating if yes. you were given the insight, but he's not going to sign off on that. It's the same it's the exact reason why he would not cooperate and he told uh, Mel Carmerson and his father not to cooperate with the Paul Colford book because they were he was actually going to expose him for being basically derivative and uh, a failure in so many and, ways, especially with the Fox pilots. And unknown to Paul he was going to do that Howard knew he was going to do that but Paul didn't know he was about to do that that's Paul right and he, everything terrible. Howard said and early on in his career he was so desperate for fame he would have talked to anybody so he did interviews yeah. for Newsday with um, Paul Colford and he was fine with it but once it once he came out he was releasing a book that's going to not actually jibe with his own narcissist his own bullshit account of his his career then he could he could not sign off on it you know, and i believe sometime i have to search the archives he might have actually trashed the book on the air i have no idea oh, I, I think he did yeah um yeah. you know when you guys did your um, debut podcast last week i was listening to it and i wanted so badly to weigh in because um uh, howard is telling ablo from the start I don't even know why we're doing this bit. I, it's not going to be good. Right? And yeah. obviously this bit's not going to happen if you didn't approve it. You yeah. you said it was okay. You're far too afraid to have this conversation with your wife off the air, mm -hmm. but uh, you want to have it with her so you can have it on the air. But um, when asked a certain question, for, like uh, – well, here's, here's the picture I had in my mind as Howard was talking, and it kind of relates to this movie. Howard and Beth were talking. If I, if you're driving down the highway and I'm a cop and I pull you over and I say, I have, I'm looking for a trunk full of drugs and guns. Do I have permission to search your trunk? And what would you say? Well, yeah, if you, if you, if you, yeah of course. You're busted. Right, because you have nothing to hide. Right. Beth and Howard's equivalent is you're wasting your time. Why would you want to look in my trunk? There's not, I'm telling you right now, you're not going to see it. So a guilty person <laughs> tells you, you're not, you're wasting your time. There's no point. There's no, yeah. an innocent person goes, go ahead. So that's yeah. Howard's approach. To, why would anyone write a book about me? Why would it, you know, like you're guilty. That's why you're so worried about someone writing a book about you. That's why someone you're worried about someone telling the true story about you. And that's why that's you. Why that's why you won't. You won't actually put up money for a person to come in and test to see if your hair is real because they'll figure out in about half a second that it's yeah. completely. Uh, I said uh, yeah. I would rather tell you what a stupid idea this is and what a waste of time it is and so on. Yeah. So thanks. Uh, any other closing thoughts, Sam, before we wrap this up? Because it's gone a little longer than we thought, but uh, uh, we're, we apologize, everybody. But <laughs> we'll, we'll make this our hearts of darkness instead of Apocalypse Now. And uh, you'll hopefully think of it in that way of more of a peeling back the onions as opposed to uh, an actual commentary. I love uh, the introspection. It's so great. Well, apparently, mm -hmm. people people are, people are uh, telling us, giving us decent feedback, unless they're full of shit, and you know we'll keep doing it. Uh, but um, coming up, we're going to actually, I can, if Ben, if it's okay to say, uh, about the Miss America. Yeah, at some point. Okay, at some point, we're going to Sam, Ben, and I are going to pick chapters of um, Miss America, and we're going to be d doing what we did with the. Quiver's a life book, except in piecemeal, we'll be doing things chapter by chapter or two chapters in one, depending how little there is in one. And we'll be releasing them as analysis, analysis, analyses of the book itself. And we'll talk about it in depth and we'll be doing those out uh, over time. Um, but we'll, <coughs> also, we'll also be doing weeks in review, of course, everybody. Check us out on our Facebook page at Quite Frankly. You can see us on Twitter at uh, Sammy Therese and at Fillmore Fingers. And um, we thank you for listening and hope you enjoyed it.
take care, everybody.